Bruce, are you ready to go ahead and start? You are, okay. Oh, thank you. Good morning. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Bruce, I can handle it from here. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a welcome to the October 6th meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Our chair, uh, Greg Caput, is stuck in traffic. And so we're gonna start, I've checked with the vice chair who's checking in remotely and I'll lead the meeting until uh, Chair Caput. Oh, he just walked in. <laughs> there we go. Give it a second. <laughs> Maybe we could just do the roll call while we're-, while sure. we're uh... We'll call the roll. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. McPherson? Here. And Chair Caput? Here. Why don't we start with just a, a, a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, we didn't know how long you'd be. Dear Caput and members of the board, we do have a number of revisions and corrections to the agenda. On item 44, we have additional materials. Uh, there's a revised memo packet page 1,115. 1, there's a correction. The item should read defer to November 10th, 2020, consideration of a proposed contract for consulting staff and resources to process building and related permits for reconstruction of structures affected by the CZU August Lightning Complex fire and accept and file status report on two implementation activities as recommended by the planning director. For item 46, we also have a correction. The item should read ratify approval of contract with CalWest Construction General Building Incorporated in the amount of $438,580 for the Cathedral Drive PM 1.21 2017 storm damage repair project is recommended by the Deputy CAO Director of Public Works. We also have an addenda to the consent agenda. Item 29.1 is asking the board to adopt 16 resolutions appointing the unopposed special district candidates who have filed declarations of candidacy for the November 3rd, 2020 presidential general election and adopt two resolutions accepting applications and appointing candidates for two vacancies as recommended by the county clerk. There's a board memo printout and the 16 resolutions are attached. And I believe that's all we have. Okay, thank you. Uh, do any board members wish to pull a consent item to the regular agenda? Okay, uh, we'll move on to uh, public comment and uh, uh, chair. We'll go right before this, we're gonna allow uh, Supervisor uh, McPherson to make, uh, to say something. Bruce, we can't hear you. Supervisor, you're on mute. <laughs> uh, I should be unmuted now. Oh, we're okay. You're okay now. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Well, good. Okay. Uh, I have some very good news uh, uh, from our personnel director, Ajita Patel, about um, the uh, layoff notices that we had to go through. Uh, I have our budget sessions because of COVID and so forth, the difficult budget situation we were in. Uh, at that time, uh, for October, there were 37 positions that... Uh, needed to be addressed. And I am very happy to announce that uh, 
Uh, 26 of those positions that uh, had a dateline for October to be addressed uh, have been. Uh, and very, uh, well, there, there have been some retirements, about eight, I guess, but uh, employees have been, uh, they've been placed in alternate county positions or uh, have avoided the layoff notices. Um, of 26, uh, of those 26, 24 have been placed. Two of those others are going to other positions outside of the county. So that is excellent news. And the, the remaining 11, uh, their deadline date is, so to speak, is on in December, and I hope we can fill those. So it is very good news to know that uh, those positions that um, we needed to have uh, that were uh, going to be laid off in October, uh, they have been placed, uh, 26 of those, of the 26, 24 have been placed in county government, and two others are going to someplace else in the private sector. So. Congratulations to our personnel department for working with our employees to get uh, to have them continue employment. It's great news, and we hope that uh, we can have welcoming news for the remaining 11 uh, come December. So thank you very much to our personnel department and for the whole county staff. Uh, very good news. It was a very troubling time when we had to lay off some positions, uh, eliminate some positions during our budget sessions that we just completed. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, it is good news. Uh, I'll just ask uh, uh, for the 26. That's wonderful. For the 11, uh, they're they're okay until until December now instead of October. That's correct. That's, that's correct. Right understand. Yes. Okay. So they're right now. We're still looking at the 11 and trying to place. That's them. correct, Supervisor That's Caput. Okay. Personnel's working to place the remaining 11. You bet. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bruce. Supervisor Caput, if I may, if I may, if I may remind everybody, we have a lot of outside people on joining us on our Teams call today. If you would please remember to mute yourself, otherwise, we hear you in our chambers. Thank you. Okay, and uh, how many people want to speak on the pub public comment? <laughs> okay, if if you want the whole three minutes, uh, could we do the, uh, and then we'll go to two minutes only because we've got a full agenda today. Uh, the first the first ones uh, that really want to speak for three minutes come up and uh, line up now. That'd be good. Okay. Hi, Gary. Uh, Gary Richard, Arnold Chairman, Supervisors, and Bruce McPherson here. Um, I'm talking about the uh, Red Chinese influence in our, our particular area. Uh, we have in a magazine here I'm talking about uh, organizations that are involved in the violence, and they talk about the Revolutionary Communist Party, Indivisible, Antifa, and California Forward. Both Bruce McPherson and Fred Keeley are integral parts of, Calif of uh, Leon Panetta's organization, uh, California Forward. Uh, it turns out that Leon Panetta's uh, co-founder is Lenny Mendonca, who advocates getting rid of 80% uh, of the local government. I've also got the news release from AP in which Willie Brown said to get rid of all, uh, all counties and governments. Um, right now, uh, Bruce McPherson is the man in charge of uh, uh, AMBAG, which is a COG, a Council of Government. It's no more than a Soviet. And we see that CalCOG has put out literally a parallel government with the California bear uh, replacing what is supposed to be going on in front here, but is really hidden behind the machine, uh, behind the newspapers. 93% uh, of the newspapers are controlled by the Council on foreign relations. I think I've given you information on that. Uh, also new information about Leon Panetta and his uh, friend, Hugh DeLacy. Uh, it turns out that the community foundation that is making all the orders, uh, the stand-ins and setting up trackers and tracers inside this county that is no more than anything that Mao or what they did in Cambodia. They're being trained in this building 
um, at least last week when I was walking by the meeting. Um, Hugh DeLacy was honored by the Community Foundation. It shows here that Hugh DeLacy went to Red China and he visited Solomon Adler. Solomon Adler uh, was a veteran Soviet agent. Uh, there are emails back and forth from Hugh DeLacy to John Service in the Amerasia case in which they had stolen many secret files from the US government to support communist Red China. So we see not only uh, uh, the California Forward, our community organization that has been uh, paid, uh, Margaret Lopez, who makes all the policies being paid by a secret donor. And this includes conspiracy by the general counsel, by we've got pictures of Palacios here together with Susan True. You cannot have authority given to this lady without your conspiring against the people. And I ask you to uh, uh, take care of that as soon as possible. Uh, here's the article, Brown seeks to abolish local governments. That's exactly what you're doing behind the people's back. Thank you. Thank you. For the people standing in line to speak, if you towards the back could please push out further into the hallway, you can hear the meeting in there. That way we can social distance and keep six feet apart. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Drew Lewis. It's uh, farther in the line if you want to sit down. That's I, would, I would like to give some of my speaking time to have a moment of silence to honor the victims of the illegal, unscientific, and draconian lockdown measures imposed upon our people and community. Many people have suffered increased suicides, job losses, business failures, domestic violence, increased homelessness, and societal collapse. We are now seeing the outcome of this policy spreading out on our streets in the form of homeless, destitute families, all for a disease that has a mortality that is less than half that of the seasonal flu, according to the Center for Disease Control. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Wow. Hi. Hi, I'm John David. Um, I'd like to talk about the, the consideration of extending the lock, the uh, emergency or not. I don't care what you have to say. It doesn't matter anyway. Whatever it is, I'm against it. No matter who conceived it or commenced it, I'm against it. That was a Marx Brothers song and I changed the lyric. Well, we've been spun to arguing about this crazy COVID thing by media bought by corporations. Let's come together in cooperation to heal our nation. And social media as well has led this contentious hell where many are stuck in echo chambers. So many who were friends now act like strangers, increasing danger to dis Disagree with COVID rules is called the mark of crazy fools who simply don't care since they're deluded. But most have studied evidence and concluded someone colluded. Corruption is running wild. The money trail that was left behind in 2000 starts with Bill Gates' mastermind of the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. That's UNICEF, World Bank, the WHO, and Bill's Foundation working for the creation of healthy vaccine markets. Warren Buffett in 2006 gave 85% of his fortune, get this, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, 85%. It's a 20, 20 to 1 return, says Bill with elation, to invest in vaccination. On April 4th, 2009, the WHO announced the flu called swine. On their website, a month later, they changed the definition of pandemic by making the omission of two conditions. They kept the virus that had to be new which humans have no immunity to, but took out the several epidemics and high death numbers are no longer a yardstick for a pandemic. Then, then what does that mean? Is that my end? You won't believe the answer they gave. When asked the reason for the change they made, the who called the definition, quote, a rather bleak picture that could be very scary 
so they prefer a definition that's scarier. When January 2010 came around, Bill Gates called out the time is now and promised to give 10 billion to the WHO to bring a decade of vaccines to be ready for new pandemics. At the end of 2019, MIT, a new way to record vaccination history, smartphone readable quantum dots that penetrate and embed within your skin through tiny needles. The brainchild of Bill Gates, he funded it and asked for it. What do you think of that? Okay, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Monica McGuire continuing on. This year, when March 11th rolled round, the WHO's director issues a sound. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 could be characterized as a pandemic. Not is a pandemic? In interesting turn of phrase. It's also interesting to note the day before the WHO declared their vote, its partner, the COVID-19 Therapeutics Accelerator, got a $125 million promise to forget me not from the Gates and from MasterCard. What? On the 20th of March, the WHO guideline implementation of global surveillance of COVID-19 defines confirmed case as laboratory confirmation. No matter what the clinical signs and symptoms, that's a new definition no one ever used before. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Trust manages assets the foundation invests in the companies that are given the grants. So often grants return to the pockets of Bill's pants, quite a slick dance. As Dr. Levitt Stanford's owned, who won a Nobel Prize has shown, Sweden achieved herd immunity without a lockdown wrecking their communities. Yet with impunity, you officials say hunker down. Saying more lockdowns, you're predicting to ensure that COVID's really through. But so much of what we're told makes no sense. We need a public debate about the pretense that lockdowns make any sense. More like too much misery. Why does big business get a pass while smaller ones get kicked in the ass? The, those that survive must social distance. That bleeds us dry and soon out of existence. We can't pay our rents. The global lockdown has destroyed tens of millions of jobs, many now unemployed, and greatly disrupted the global supply chain. Millions of small and medium-sized businesses up in flames whenever and wherever a lockdown came. The fear and isolation drive us overdose to suicide, violence at home, depression and anxiety. For children and the disabled, there's more suffering. Worldwide, there's more poverty, worse than the virus could ever be. By keeping apart and hiding our face, our right to assembly gone, kept in our place, and declaring us all biohazards? This unelected power plays manufactured and our health freedoms shattered. The children have to suffer most with fear of friends they're forcefully dosed. Humanity hid behind platforms, partitions. What kind of kids will come from these conditions of division? Let freedom ring again. Thank you. So, <laughs> hard act to follow. But I wanna commend um, the members of our community who have utilized their creativity to communicate the things that need to be communicated. Um, we just said the Pledge of Allegiance. And um, my name is Jay Rosella Myers and I am a member of the first district and an ex-employee of the County of Santa Cruz in the personnel department. And I commend you all for all your hard work of trying to find placement and jobs for people who have probably been working here for some time and hopefully stay eligible for their um, retirement at some point. And that's really important to a lot of the employees here. 
but in the Pledge of Allegiance, the final lines say, liberty and justice for all. And that is such a primary part of the Santa Cruz community as individuals to think for ourselves and to be able to have the free choice to live the kind of lives that we wanna live, you know, and all this pandemic stuff has made criminals out of people who wanna still have free choice. We need to stay passionate about the idea that we have the possibility of people being able to think for themselves and to have elected officials who will allow for that and listen to us. So I plead with all of you to listen to our incredible community about all the amazing input that we have about other choices that might be available to us in terms of how to deal with something like this. And I thank you all for your public service and your abilities to help us all achieve what we need as an independent thinking community. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, I'm here to talk about something totally different. My name is Ann Thrift. I'm a recent evacuee from the CZU complex lightning fires. Um, and I'm here to talk about two things. One is the fact of what happened that night on the 18th with the supposed emergency warning system, which is not working, I'm gonna tell you about. And second, the subject of homeowners flood insurance does not usually cover earth movement. And this, what I'm gonna talk about here is also relevant to evacuation, having to do with debris flow. Um, I live on Lower 230s. My name is Ann Thrift. I think I said that. I live on Lower 236 near the Fourth Acorn in Boulder Creek. My house is still standing between ashy slopes of the acorns and a fallen leaf, both of which were mostly destroyed. I want to thank the county for responding quickly to con coordinate help for all of us after we evacuated. But you need to know about a couple of problems that would also affect the debris flow issue. The emergency warning system we kept hearing about last year at all those wildfire preparedness meetings I attended did not work for everyone. I speak for others who didn't know on August 18th what fires were happening, where, how close, how urgent, if we had orders to evacuate, what that meant, how to do it, where to go, or who to believe about any of this. We all had different expectations or didn't know what to expect, and this went on for hours and hours and hours. The only emergency warning system that night in much of San Lorenzo Valley was social media, next door or Facebook, not code red, which we were all told to sign up for, not reverse 911 if that's even still around. Many of us signed up for code red and never got a single alert. I haven't, not in two years. Some got alerts for areas in other counties one said a CAL FIRE helicopter hovered over the golf course yelling something they couldn't hear and then found out it was in the wrong neighborhood. No sheriffs came knocking door to door or down the street with a loudspeaker. Even they didn't know what was happening until late that night. Now the county is discussing warning the same people about debris flow. I'm trying to imagine just how you expect to do this when those things move a lot faster than fire. So you have several problems. The first three are there's no emergency warning system that actually warns everyone in an emergency. We just experienced this. If you build one that actually works, you need to communicate exactly what it is, how it works to everyone proactively, not passively. And you need to make sure everyone knows exactly what to expect, what to do, and where to go. My last comments have to do with financing and also how you evacuate people with no cars, who don't drive, who have nowhere to go. My uh, insurance paid for a hotel. It won't for earth movement. I just checked. No flood, no homeowner's insurance pays for that. You guys have a big problem ahead of you. I have other comments I will submit. Thank you. Hi, Marilyn. Hi, uh, Marilyn Garrett, part of Wireless Radiation Alert Network. And today, first of all, I want to thank the people who spoke before me and putting facts to songs. I'm thinking of a book I have called Living Downstream. An ecologist looks at cancer and the environment, 
by Dr. Sandra Steingraber. She is a biologist, a poet, a cancer survivor, a mother, an author, and the title Living Downstream comes from a parable where a community living downstream got very good at rescuing people who were just about drowning coming downstream. And they got very good at it. And she says, no one looks at who's pushing them in the stream. Her book is the journey upstream to see the powers that are destroying people. And as I listen to the song today, I'm thinking how we are all downstream. We are all downwind and we are being inundated with corporate propaganda pushing us to our, our deaths. And we need to be stopping this. As I was, I read the county document called Protecting Public Health from Fire Ash. And there was a tiny list of the toxins in this fire ash. Oh, also in her book, she says, it's a form of homicide when people are dying. And she said, it's intolerable that corporations are putting known and suspected carcinogens into the environment instead of prohibiting their generation in the first place. We need to be prohibiting toxins from being put in forcefully into our environment and our bodies. And as I looked at the list from the county of metals and arsenic, and it's only a partial list of what's in these ashes, if it had just been trees burning, we wouldn't have all these uh, carcinogens and PCBs and fire retardants and pesticides and also the uh, pollutants from all the um, utilities and microwaves. Your job is to genuinely protect public health, not the corporate wealth. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. Um, I'm Mary Jo Walker. I live in the San Lorenzo Valley, Lompico specifically. I'm here to talk about emergency exit routes out of the county roads. But before I do that, I wanted to say two other things. Um, my experience during the evacuation is very similar to Ms. Thrift. Um, I just wanted to say that she's not the only one. And uh, I, get, uh, I got all my information off the internet. However, many of us live in areas which are so rural, we don't get cell reception. So my internet comes off of a router and if there's no electricity, no, no router, no information. Um, and the second thing I wanted to mention also is that I know you have a, um, my, my heart goes out to the thousand or so families that lost their homes. Fortunately, I'm not in that situation. I don't know what I would do, but I do feel for them. I know you have a lot on your plate right now, what with the uh, recovery and rebuilding effort from the fire. Uh, there's a lot to do. Um, but I wanted to say immediately after the evacuation ended, when people started moving back into Lompico, uh, and right away there was a lot of discussion about the exit routes out of Lompico. You may or may not know that there is one road in, one road in and out. And um, uh, the last evacuation we had during the fire was very orderly, was well managed by our fire department, but we had 24 hours. If we only had 15 hours, if there was a fire that started there, 15 minutes, I mean, if there was a fire that started there and we had to get out pronto, you can bet people would be burning alive on that road. I'm pretty sure of it. And it's not just a problem in Lompico. I'm sure there's areas all over the county. There's probably areas in other areas in San Lorenzo Valley. There's probably Bonnie Dune, probably Bonnie Dune. There's people that have limited access in the case of emergency, maybe at the summit. Um, Coralitos, maybe at Mount Madonna. All over the county, there's problems with emergency exits. And um, 
I know that your county, you were dealing with uh, putting together a long-term recovery, rebuilding effort. I don't, I'm not sure what to call it in response to climate change. And this should be part of it. This should be part of emergency exits needs to be part of your climate change response. There are emergency exits out of Lompico that could be used in the case of emergency. I'd like to see those developed and announced so that people know that we have a plan for us up there rather than hundreds of people burning alive. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. Uh, pardon me for the hat. It's a little easy to wear this mask with it on. Uh, I came down here to, do, to address the same matter my wife did. Uh, this, is, this issue has been discussed for a long time in Lompico Canyon, but it seems as though uh, this is the time to really talk about it. Uh, there are two, uh, Lompico has a, a bulk of housing right in the center of a three and a half mile long canyon. Most of the people live on the east and west side of the central core of that canyon. All the roads are two lane. The exit road is two lane constrained in a channel with a creek on one side and a mountainside on the other. So if there's a traffic accident in that road in the midst of a rush evacuation, it's gonna be a mess. So uh, from the eastern side, there's an existing road alignment. Apparently the landowner wants to subdivide the property through which this road passes. I've, we've spoken to the fire, uh, uh, the uh, fire chief, John Stives for Zyandi. He's fully aware of this. It's got a gate on it right now. This just needs to be formalized so that uh, there's a process set up and the road's checked for its width and so forth. It doesn't need, because it would be an emergency only use road, it's not gonna have to conform to ordinary construction standards. On the western side of the canyon from what's called West Drive, there is another series of road alignments that exit all, exits all the way out to beyond the Newell Creek Dam. This road could also be converted into an emergency gated exit under the control of the sheriff and the uh, fire department. So anyway, I would hope that this could be put on the public works schedule uh, to uh, get into sometime within the next, well, I don't know what the schedule is, so I won't propose a time, but it's, it's really not gonna be uh, as difficult. Right now I'm working on matters that involve the Public Utilities Commission, the Board of Forestry, and uh, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. These are vastly more complicated than what I decided to come down here to speak about this morning. And uh, there may there are a few legal issues associated with road right of ways and so forth, but the county has all the authority it needs to establish these escape routes. And as my wife said, there are likely to be other box canyons in the Santa Cruz Mountains all the way from Watsonville to uh, Davenport that could benefit from better escape access. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, good morning. My name's Shalak Kavanis. I love Santa Cruz. I, I love Santa Cruz. Uh -huh. um, I have, uh, thank you for your service and thank you for your support. I am the chairperson for the Santa Cruz County Mental Health Advisory Board. And I'm here to address the very last letter in your correspondence, which is um, a support for the Recovery Cafe. And I have another member of the Mental Health Advisory Board who's gonna say a little bit more. Thank you. Hey, good to see you. Good morning. Um, thanks for giving us all a little time to speak. Uh, the Recovery Cafe started in Seattle uh, as a nonprofit, and there's about 12 independent nonprofits around the country. And we formed a nonprofit for Santa Cruz. Um, we're, uh, uh, it's pretty much just a drop-in center. People are expected to be clean, but they get recovery groups each week, get a cup of coffee, maybe some resources, and uh, maybe some classes. With COVID, as we were about to start, we've had to rethink it. So we're looking at maybe doing some groups, outside groups, COVID safe, at either the shelters or outside at a food pantry, something like that. So just asking if at some point in the future, whether we could do a 10 minute presentation for you guys to get your support too. Cool. Yeah. I think your microphone's not on. 
want to thank both of you for your uh, help and uh, dedication to the mental health advisory board. You guys have done a wonderful job. I just so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Greg comes to almost almost every meeting. You have not missed a meeting, and it's so great to have your support. And it's great to have the rest of the support. The the board of supervisors who's been here, who, who know the system, know how important mental health and behavioral health is. And you guys have continually and consistently supported it. At the last beginning of last month, when we had the um, uh, disease of addiction. A presentation with amazing speakers here and it's one of the reasons why Santa Cruz is so beautiful and such a wonderful place and thank you for your guys' service. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for all your support with COVID, with evic ev eviction protection, with the fires, the amount of support that you're giving the community. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, supervisors. <clears throat> the citizens of New California State are issuing this notification of present presentment and recognition of New California State. We, the citizens of New California State, are determined to live under a state government in the United States of America and under the Constitution of America. New California Declaration of Independence, January 15, 2018, states whenever any form of government becomes destructive, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government when a long train of abuses and acts to seize and hold the people's power without legal authority and pursuing invariably the same object that clearly demonstrates a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. Our vision, a representative government for citizens adhering to the United States Constitution. Our mission, formation of New California State. Statement of intent, the citizens of New California have decided to remedy the abuse of power by the Constitution, Article 4, Section 3, and Section 4. The United States Constitution, Article 4, Section 3 states, new states may be admitted by Congress into this union but no new state shall be formed or created within the jurisdiction of any other state of, without the consent of the legislature of the states concerned as well as of the Congress. United States Constitution, Article 4, Section 4, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion and on application of the legislature or of the executive when the legislature cannot be convened against domestic violence. Respectfully, Mark Doring, Senator Pro Tem. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Julie Could Kelly. Be able to pull it down. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm Julie Kelly with New California State. Order of the day. Arrest the Senate president. Well, we, the, the people of the uni um, Unified Counties of New California, seek the approval of California State President of the Senate, Tony G. Atkins, born August 1st, 1962, is an American politician serving as the 51st and current president pro tempore of the California State Senate since 2018. A member of the Democratic Party, she previously served as the 69th Speaker of the California State Assembly from 2014 to 2016. Upon her election as Speaker of the State Assembly, she became the third woman and first acknowledged lesbian to be elected into the position as well as the first lawmaker from San Diego holding the office. She served on the San Diego City Council from 2000 to 2008, including a term as acting mayor of San Diego in 2005. She also served as acting governor of California for nine hours on July 30th, 2014. In 2018, she succeeded Kevin DeLeon as state Senate president pro tempore. This made her the first woman and the only LGBT person to lead the California State Senate. Katie Grimes of the California Globe reported on March 19th, 2020. While most of the California public and news media was focused on the coronavirus, the California State Senate worked into the evening Monday and passed Senate Resolution 86, 
allowing the Senate President Pro Tem Tony Atkins to assign, remove, and replace. Is, was that my time? You have one minute. Okay. Oh. And you must wear your, your mask over okay. your nose. Okay. Um, this made her, um, Senate Tony to authorize one or more members of the committee uh, to participate by telephone, teleconference, or other electronic means. This means senators do not have to be in the Capitol or on the Senate floor to vote on legislation. Legislation. Atkins said this resolution provides her with the flexibility to function during the time of crisis and allow Senate to be more nimble and responsive during emergencies. Atkins also said allowing senators to part participate remotely authorizes the public to participate remotely, but would never be or would be used rarely if ever. SR 86 was introduced March 16, 2020 and adopted through a voice vote. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning. I'm here today to talk a little bit about common sense, honor, and courage. And I'm talking about this today because it's come to my attention that someone I know has severe uh, health issues and went to a facility to get help with these health issues, specifically digestion and malnutrition, only to find out that this facility, which is not cheap, I'll tell you, um, they don't even serve organic food. They don't even serve anything of quality. It's, it's, it's literally these packaged meals that are devoid of nutrition, which is the absolute opposite of what this person needs. So it comes to common sense. This is insane. You know, this is, this is Santa Cruz County, California, the United States of America. This is basically the, one of the brightest jewels of the world as far as the beauty that's around us and the amazing resources that we have, not only natural resources, but also human resources. The, the mines here, the research that's done here, what people know here is amazing. And yet we are in this place where we're doing completely insane things. We had plastic straws banned, and yet I have myself, I have about probably 70 little plastic containers that I've taken home from, as to-go things from the restaurants and wash them out to reuse them because I'm not gonna throw them away. Each one of these things is you know, at least a straw or two straws. It's insane. What are we doing? Look at the amount of, of, of trash that's being produced by this lockdown, which as you have all seen with numerous different sources of information in this room, week after week, month after month, is not appropriate at all. And it's time for you guys to really decide where do you stand? Where do you stand in history? Do you wanna go down in history as people who just caved in to something that makes no sense whatsoever, hurting your very county that you live in, the county where your family is growing up, where you live? It's time to be brave. It's time to take a stand and do the right thing. Use common sense, have honor, have courage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Dave Willis. I wanted to come and ask if um, somebody, some people can start like a program, a letter writing program to like the fire I want to call them, I'm going to say firefighters, because there's men and women. I don't want to say firemen. I don't want to be misunderstood. Firefighters. Write a, a letter writing campaign so that they can like be given the thanks and appreciation that we should have, or I think we have. You know, I mean, I would do it. I don't know how. Wrote a letter, tried to send it to them. I don't know if they got it, but it, bothers me and I hope that somebody can do that, can start some kind of programs to let these fire people know that we appreciate them greatly because we see the work they're doing, the fighting and all of that. And um, like I, I got $200, I wanted to buy them some water or something, but I wouldn't know what to do or how to do that to get it to them. So 
my request is that if somebody, some people can start some kind of programs, whereas we can let those people know if we appreciate them or how great we do. And I wanted to say, as far as voting, we can start voting right now, today. You, we don't have to wait till November. I used to think that, but it's not that way. We can start voting right now. Definitely go out and vote. Don't let nobody lie to you, telling you, you to try to steal your vote. Many, so many people have suffered and died for the chance to get to vote. This is our time, it's serious, to stand with them so we can, um, we have to uh, fight for our rights to vote. Um, now is the time to stand up and be counted. Um, definitely go out here and vote. We, we got to get these people out of these offices. They are harmful to America. They have not helped America. Let's hold them accountable. Get them out of there. It's time to vote. If you got questions, you can call, contact voter registration wherever you are. They can answer all your questions. Any question you have, they can answer all of them. They have safe ways to vote. Vote online, boxes throughout the county. Definitely do it. Stand up and vote. It's serious. It's time. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Hey, good morning. It's really nice to be able to show up somewhere and look people in the eye and talk and have it be recorded. I'm not really uh, sure what to talk about because there's so many things to comment on later. There's uh, over 1,100 pages of uh, information this today. Three weeks ago, there was over 980. Uh, I would so rather talk about all the fun stuff I'm doing and all the people I'm actually helping in youth with activities and making some really, that's not really crazy food. I'm just processing a lot of food and it's pretty good. Uh, so I just really don't know where to begin because uh, we have a population that is really living in a state of fear and um, they're not reaching out to each other and there's just ridiculous, such non-common sense things going on. Uh, so possibly I'll just wait to speak on other matters. I mean, I was going to contemplate thinking about, so you think you want to attempt to take down the deep state? That would probably take a little bit more time than three minutes to discuss, but uh, one would need to kind of go back to how we got here and just go back in time and look at really our food supply and how everything has been so centralized and um, constrained into machines taking over things instead of the farmers. You know, 80 years ago, 100 years ago, over 40% of the food that people ate, they grew in their own gardens and it's all been really controlled. You know, more than 100 years ago, individuals knew a great deal about medicine because they were just taught that. And now we are dependent on largely Western medicine, which is petrochemicals. And I could go into some more detail about that, but I'll talk about other stuff later. Thank you, it's really nice to be able to be here. I will say that I haven't been engaging with law enforcement as much as I usually do, but I had a delightful, maybe it's hard to say delightful, but it was a really respectful conversation with two officers about 10 days ago. So thank you all. Hey, you're, thank you. And, uh, do we have uh, anyone in, uh, downstairs or online? Um, the community room is closed today because we don't need to have, there's, we have plenty of room up here today. However, we do have um, four web comments. So the first one is from Karen Ehrlich. I am a, Lump I am a Lompico resident. It is a wonderful that a section of Lompico Road that took three years to get repaired was indeed ready to use during the August evacuations. That said, 
I believe that wildfires have pointed out that Lompico is vulnerable to, catas to catastrophe. We might well have other closures on our only roadway that would make it a lethal situation. There are possibilities for emergency exits to be put in place at the order of this board. Mary Jo Walker and Kevin Collins have explicit suggestions for how to develop emergency road access that would be under the control of our sheriffs and the Zianti Fire Department. Then in case of dire emergencies, residents could be evacuated over routes that are open up only in the case of dire need. The grand jury report that so thoroughly criticized the county for de deficits in protecting Santa Cruz citizens specifically point, pinpointed Lompico as the area of the entire, as, excuse me, so specifically pinpointed Lompico as the area of the entire county at the highest risk for fire disaster. That we only have a single narrow road that is at risk of outages at all times must be included in the board's deliberation about how to mitigate the risk to approximately 1800 residents of our Box Canyon. We must have alternate escape routes secured so that my neighbors and I can get out at the same time that emergency responders can get in. I hope all of you, but especially Supervisor McPherson, who represents Lone Pico, will make this a highest priority among the priorities that you must address. <clears throat> the second one is from Jessica Peters, dear Board of Supervisors. I'm asking you to pull item number 28 from the consent agenda and do not approve as written. The response, ready, aim, fire, Santa Cruz County in the hot seat. Report should be further evaluated. These responses were never, these responses would never fly in the private sector and are not acceptable here. To simply copy and paste answers from one document to another is appalling and shows a clear lack of engagement from this board as well as its administration. It doesn't even appear that the time was taken to proofread as there are typos and errors within. Given what your, our community has just gone through, I urge you to treat this report as a valuable tool it was designated to be, thank you. The third comment is from Zia Isola. Dear supervisors, I'm sorry I cannot attend the meeting today, but I hope this message will reach you. There are over 1,000 residents living in the Lompico Canyon, yet only a single two mile long narrow road that leads in and out of the canyon. The road is bounded on one side by a creek and the other side by steep cliffs. There is no driving on the shoulder because there is no shoulder. If all residents had to evacuate, the road would be hopelessly clogged. Black to e blocked to egress as well as ingress by emergency vehicles. This is a disaster waiting to happen. Please consider what would happen if a fast moving fire were to sweep through the canyon. It would be a scenario similar to the Paradise Fire where the line of cars was so long and slow moving that evacuees could not escape the fire. I strongly urge the county to add additional routes out of the canyon. With the intensity and frequency of fires only increasing in California, this course of action is both sensible and urgent. There are already existing road alignments that could be developed. One begins off of Upper Lake Boulevard that would allow emergency exit down to the intersection of Lompico Road and East Sianti from West Drive. There are considerable connectable road sections leading out and exit into Newell Creek Road near the Loch Lomond Dam. It would be far safer to have three exits rather than a single narrow road. In addition to the residents of the canyon, in non-pandemic times there are dozens of visitors at Loch Lomond during the summer. The county has a moral obligation to establish additional roads out of the canyon. Hundreds of lives are potentially at stake. Please take action. Thank you for giving this matter your attention and consideration. The last one is from Satya Orion. I was shown a letter from Whole Foods manager, Seth Wayland, who his employees, which states, we got some clarification on mask wearing in stores. So here's your new standard operating procedure on front door mask monitoring. There is no longer a medical reason not to wear a mask. Here's the direct verbiage from the Santa Cruz County Health Officer. Seth Whalen goes on to quote Debbie Kessler, County Environmental Health Specialist, regarding the medical issue, there are no provisions in the state of California mask requirements for a medical condition. The Health Officer for Santa Cruz County is also a doctor and she has stated that there is no respiratory condition that would prevent anyone from wearing a mask even COPD or asthma. As far as the state and county are concerned, everyone should be wearing a mask while shopping, no medical exceptions. I have written twice to Gail Newell to ask if she had in fact made the statement and why she would, and why she would do so. Given the fact that medical exemptions are included in both the state of California and the Santa Cruz mask guidelines, I received no reply. 
Why is the county allowing a staff person to give false misleading medical opinion on a, and legal advice to businesses? Who has authorized the environmental health specialist to make public policy? Is the county willing to assume liability for the consequences of this action? And why has no one responded to these concerns? And public comment is complete now. Thank you. Okay. That should be <coughs> uh, That concludes uh, item number five, public comment. Next, we have item number six, uh, action on the consent agenda. And do any board members have comments or additional direction for items on the consent agenda? Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of comments that I'd like to offer. On item number 26, I'd like to just thank the Second Harvest Food Bank for their ongoing work being hunger fighters and, and, and uh, providing food to people most in need, especially during this COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, they've been incredibly helpful in making sure that people who have never s sought uh, uh, food before from the food bank have been there. And I just wanna appreciate the good work that they do. On item number 28, which is the grand jury reports, I think that uh, the uh, reports bring up some significant issues and I'm, uh, I'm ready to support the uh, recommended actions. I do wanna note that our system just went through a real time stress test. Stress test. And in that stress test, uh, the, uh, the, all the agencies in Santa Cruz were able to work together with the mutual aid agreement under a unified command to be able to fight the fire when no one else was available uh, to help us out. They did an amazing job. We call them heroes. And we will learn much from the after incident report that will help improve our county fire system. Uh, but I think that it, it will be important to look at that, what actually happened during the biggest fire crisis that we have as the best test of what uh, is going on with our fire system. On uh, item number 33, um, I look forward to having a public discussion about the possible expansion of the Live Oak parking program. Um, the program as it stands right now was created many, many years ago. Uh, I look forward to working with Department of P Public Works and the community to uh, redesign this program to be more effective uh, and to reach the neighborhoods that are most uh, greatly impacted. On item number 36, uh, this uh, regular report on measures to reduce the number of people being held in jail before trial. Uh, it, we have seen a lot change obviously since the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, but these numbers about concurrences, about uh, an effective tool that has proven its effectiveness over 14 years still seems remarkably low and we could do a better job and make sure that people aren't held uh, uh, longer than necessary uh, in jail. Uh, I look forward to the um, uh, uh, election and the, hopefully the passage of Prop 25, which will allow us to, to get rid of the bail system. And I think we could have uh, more people that don't have to serve time in jail for just the fact that they don't have enough money. Okay. And with that, that's the end. Thank you. Any, uh, any other board members, uh, feel free to comment. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'll briefly comment. Um, this is Supervisor Friend. I'd just like to uh, thank the Parks Department on item 41 and congratulate them on their work with the Coastal Conservancy regarding Hidden Beach Park, which is uh, in the middle of some community-based fundraising for much needed upgrades, but also this will help bring our permanent restroom for those young families that use that park. Also on item 46, I wanna uh, continue to always provide my gratitude to Public Works who are continuing to work on the storm damage projects from a couple of years ago, uh, while other projects still continue to add up on to their plate. This Cathedral Drive project, I just appreciate uh, Mr. Wiesner in Public Works and, and Director Machado for your continued work in regards to that. Those are the only two items that I wanted to speak on a consent, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, there's no other comments. Uh, Chair? Yes. Yeah. Supervisor McPherson, uh, there's a couple items I wanted to comment on. Uh, number, uh, the first one is item number 28, the grand jury responses. I know that we're all very appreciative of the work by the grand jury. They put in hundreds of hours of volunteer time for this uh, valuable public service. Uh, these reports add to 
our accountability and transparency and our and how we function as a county. So I want to thank them for their service. Um, and regarding the uh, fire report specifically, there are many challenges that have been built up over the years, uh, and it's important to acknowledge those proactively. We uh, I have, and before we, the next fire season comes upon us or emergency, uh, there's vegetation management, reducing fire fuels, evacuation plans. Uh, as has been mentioned, and we, we are, I'm well aware of the Lompico situation, I can uh, assure you of that, uh, and the adequate resources to fight the fires, just to name a few of the issues, uh, as we need to prepare for the next time, if God forsake us, if it happens again. But uh, we will uh, be addressing some of those issues on our regular agenda today. On item number 29 on the coronavirus relief funds, I want to thank the CAO and the staff for bringing this item forward. I appreciate the financial uh, information on the spending to date, but the report does say that we plan to spend the majority of the remaining $14 million before the end of October. Um, and what can you tell us now that will be funded? I don't think this needs to be taken off the agenda, but. That's less than a month from now, and I just wanted to get a, a, a general overview of the plan of attack about the remaining $14 million. Supervisor McPherson, um, I believe Christina Mowry might be on who um, helped put together this item. We do have the allocations that the board approved as part of the budget actions for the revised budget. And we're happy to provide that information. There was a predetermined um, plan for spending the funds. So we could get you that information. Okay, I think that'd be great. Uh, so we could uh, specify too in the next meeting that we have as a board, just uh, where it is by the end of the month, what we're doing. Thank you. Uh, there's uh, an additional um, item on the, con the consent agenda, fire district uh, board appointments. Uh, just want to note that there's a vacancy, there's uh, the vacancies on the Ben Lomond Fire Board and the Pajaro Dunes Geological Hazardous uh, Abatement Board. And those applications need to be into the board by October 29th, if anybody's interested. Uh, for appointment uh, by the Board of Supervisors, that which will be done on November 17th. I just think it's important to know that there's some deadlines and uh, dates that need to be met for somebody that might want to serve on those boards. Uh, on the uh, on item um, 36 on pretrial services, uh, I want to thank uh, the probation department for bringing this item and for managing this important work on behalf of the county. Uh, because of this work, it, it's so critical to meet our goals to reduce recidivism and the number of people held in our jail. Is, um, I would like to, pr uh, to provide this uh, additional direction on that issue. Um, when this item comes back for another report in March of next year, I'd like to have it scheduled on the regular agenda so the board has the benefit of discussing the analysis more fully. And I think that was mentioned by Supervisor Leopold as well. Um, I think it's a, a very promising program, and I, I just would like to have more information when you come back for a report in March of next year. Um, on item 37, the harm reduction grant, uh, I want to thank the uh, Health Services Administration for seeking the additional resources to support a better health, public health outcomes around syringe services. Um, but I'd like to add another direction on this. Um, as the health, the health Services Agency, Apply, uh, applies for funding for its uh, syringe services program, uh, it should be operation, operationalized in a manner that is consistent with the previous uh, action and policy by the board. Uh, that's an important commitment we need to keep to the public. I know there's a lot on the, uh, uh, the plate of uh, the health services agency, which gets me into item number 38 on the syringe services deferral. On that note, uh, I know the COVID pandemic and the fire response has no doubt taken its toll on the Health Services Agency and all of our county departments. And it's been an enormous effort, uh, a response effort um, of the two major incidences at the same time, something like we've never seen before here. That said, I, I think the prevalence of syringe litter in our community is also a huge uh, public health problem and it's existed for many years without much improvement. Um, 
to the uh, extent that our Turin services program could have greater role in managing that problem, the community needs some solutions now. And I, I can understand the situation, as I said, with the departments and how much they've had on their plates. But we have deferred this item over and over again in a way that could lead members of the public to reasonably conclude uh, we don't believe it's a problem, but in reality it is. So I would like to make some additional direction uh, that we move the deferral from uh, the next report from May 20, uh, 2021 to February 2021 and accept no further delay beyond that point because I know that uh, this is going to be um, coming up uh, front and center for a lot of people and it's something that we have uh, deferred understandably so under the current circumstances but I think we need to really get at it sooner than May 2021 20, uh, and I'd like to see us have um, uh, more uh, a, a direct action of what we can do by February 2021. Uh, that's uh, my comments on the consent agenda, Mr. Chair. You're welcome, thank you. And Mr. Chair, Brian Coonerty, I uh, just wanted to add a couple comments. Uh, first on item number 26, which is additional funding to Second Harvest. Um, I was at one of their food distributions uh, a couple weeks ago, and the lines uh, of families uh, were long for people who were seeking food assistance in these difficult times. And um, I'm incredibly glad that we're able to add additional resources um, to help Second Harvest meet that need in our community. Item number 28, which is the grand jury reports. So I want to thank the citizens for their efforts to raise awareness around fire and homelessness um, response. And um, we I take those reports seriously, and write them closely, and we'll be working on those going forward. Um, item number 34, Supervisor Friend and I uh, are uh, asking the Board of Supervisors to write a letter uh, to uh, Senate Leader McConnell asking to wait to fill the Supreme Court uh, nomination until after the election, until after the Amer Americans' voices have been heard. Um, and finally, on item number 37 and 38, I want to support Supervisor McPherson's additional uh, directions. On item 37, it's important that, they, uh, that any additional uh, efforts be in line with what the board has directed. And on item number 38, um, we just uh, took a call last week in my office from a, a woman who found um, eight needles um, in a park adjacent to her um, to her home, and now she doesn't feel safe. Supervisor Coonerty, we missed the last few sentences that you were breaking up. Supervisor Coonerty, we've lost connection with you. I think he was ending by saying he supported what Supervisor uh, McPherson had done on items 37 and 38. And if the chair is okay with it, we can let him comment again later if, if, uh, uh, if he comes back or when he comes back. Okay. <clears throat> Yes. I believe he was just agreeing. We'll go to, yeah. yeah, yeah. Supervisor Friend, do you have anything? Uh, he already spoke. Uh, well, I, I'll just uh, number item 28. Uh, uh, thank the uh, Santa Cruz County uh, Grand Jury for all their work and uh, dedication. I know it's a job that uh, it includes a lot of hard work, a lot of investigation, and uh, you do it pretty much on a volunteer basis. Uh, you get a small stipend, but uh, other than the honor of serving on the grand jury uh, you, uh, for your time and effort, uh, uh, the only thing we can actually do for you is say thank you very much. And uh, Supervisor Coonerty, if you had anything else to add, and if you're able to get online again. 
uh, is there anybody who would like to make a motion? I would move the, uh, the, um, the consent agenda with the additional changes. Okay. Second. We have first and second. Uh, clerk will conduct the roll call vote. Come on. Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Okay. Supervisor Coonerty. Vote on the consent agenda. Supervisor McPherson. Aye. Chair Caput. Aye. And Supervisor Coonerty, are you there? Uh, I am, aye. Okay. Okay, we have a unanimous uh, roll call vote and the motion is passed. Uh, we'll move now to the regular agenda, starting with item number seven. A uh, 9646 presentation on the CZU Lightning Complex fire by representatives from the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, also known as FEMA, as outlined in the memorandum of the County Administrative Officer. Uh, thank you for all being here. Uh, uh, it's been a tough time and uh, I wanna thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you, Chair Caput. Elisa Benson, Assistant CAO, and I am gonna kick us off today in our presentation around uh, recovery frameworks with specific uh, focus on the importance of our residents, uh, businesses, individuals um, signing up for disaster related programs. So I'm gonna ask Christine to, to man, the, man the PowerPoint and I will introduce our our partners from FEMA and the state, and we'll go through today's presentation. So our, our purpose for today, as I mentioned, is part of our continued effort to provide update, updated and current information around the county's uh, recovery efforts to the board and the public at every, every possible meeting and opportunity. Just as a reminder, uh, at the 915 meeting, we focused on our efforts to streamline planning and environmental health <coughs> processes and lower fees to promote efficient rebuilding in our fire in our fire affected areas. On last week's meeting, we focused on debris flow and mudslide hazards and the importance of evacuation and our efforts along there. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on recovery more broadly and the criticality of all our residents and businesses affected by the fire, whether in the burn zone or outside of the burn zone to sign up for federal assistance programs, both FEMA and Small Business Association. Um, can we click, here we go. I'm gonna quickly go through our agenda. I'm gonna um, provide a very brief snapshot of uh, the sort of broadest disaster recovery framework and how we're organizing ourselves here at the county to meet the mission. And then I'm gonna hand it over to um, Deputy Director of Cal OES, Ryan Buris, to talk about the state's role in recovery and recovery more broadly. And I think Robert, uh, one, of his, one of his deputies will also be speaking as part of it. And then we'll be um, handing over to um, Mr. Willie Nunn, our federal coordinating officer for FEMA to talk about the, the federal framework and, and specifically us getting into those questions of individual assistance. So with that, I, and then we'll have questions of course for, for all of you. Um, before you is a, actually a, a very straightforward, um, probably one of the most straightforward, simple depictions of, of recovery, the, the federal recovery framework after a disaster. And we shared this with board members early in the incident. So as we were trying to get ourselves um, organized for what would come after initial response. And you can see this framework really focuses on what you would think first and foremost, those questions of rebuilding, but it also has a broader uh, focus on natural resources and cultural aspects that you wanna think about as you recover. The economic implications of both lost businesses, lost homes and issues around uh, what does it mean if we have people leaving the community? How do we um, take that into consideration both short and long term as we think about recovery and rebuilding? 
Obviously there's in our public infrastructure and our housing, but it really is a comprehensive approach that starts at the beginning, but actually takes a much broader um, view of, of rebuilding a community. And as we've been thinking about it, we see our recovery effort is really a moment to, to live our vision in the strategic plan. And I just wanna read that out loud, that Santa Cruz County is a healthy, safe, and more affordable community that is culturally diverse, economically inclusive, and envir environmentally vibrant. So uh, we're trying to take that, that vision that we adopted for our county overall to heart as we think about recovery in the specific communities affected by the fire. So next so slide, please, Christine. To that end, in organizing ourselves for uh, the recovery work ahead, we have taken those six pillars and sort of stretched them across what we're calling three domains. Front and center is our rebuild, um, rebuild and recovery, really built environment focused um, multidisciplinary team. And we have asked Matt Machado to really be the lead for that effort with department support from planning and environmental health. And we see that as a place where we're really gonna have to put a lot of focused resources initially. We also, of course, have our human care and recovery um, branch of, of this framework. And we have Emily Bali, our assistant director of human services to lead that along with support from Marcus Pimental, Suzanne Issey from planning on the housing side, and then Kimberly Finley for real property as we think about that. And then the other component is really around that emergency preparedness and community resilience. We heard a lot about that today in public comments. You know, how do we look at evacuation? How do we look at access? And then we also see in there, that's where you get to some of those secondary considerations in terms of longer term questions of economic impacts and how do we address those in community planning more broadly. So I'm gonna pass it to um, Mr. Buris, our uh, visitor from Cal OES, who's been incredibly helpful in bringing his team already multiple times to visit us. And, and then Mr. Nunn um, to really walk us through that broader recovery framework and the importance of, of, of signing up for programs. Okay. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, we can go to the next slide. I would like to thank you for having me here today. Uh, again, it's nice to meet some familiar faces again and nice to meet you uh, myself. Uh, just, uh, you know, this is a complex time, uh, not just for Santa Cruz, but for the state. Uh, I just, uh, yesterday I was with the director and we traveled the Zog fire and the glass fire and there's additional thousand homes destroyed, several businesses, the ag business there is just gonna be, it's gonna be extremely tough uh, for those counties because they lost most of their uh, production. The only reason I say that is I just wanna give you confidence uh, that the team is still dedicated to Santa Cruz. Uh, been with, Since day one, we've been dealing with your local leadership. Disasters are local, uh, they're led local and we're here to support you. Um, I do have a team here today. I have my um, uh, state disaster recovery coordinator, uh, Robert Troy, and I'm gonna let him speak more today than I normally do so y'all get to meet him. I did promise several weeks ago that I, I, would, I would have a dedicated branch director uh, here for Santa Cruz. Uh, that's gonna be Kendra Boya, who's, who's uh, in the back. She just arrived yesterday. She'll be here for the entirety of the incident. She will be your point, not just for individual assistance, IA, housing, but also debris, anything that deals with this branch. Our branch is gonna include Santa Cruz, San Mateo, uh, Monterey, Santa Clara, um, so that's gonna be her branch, uh, but she's, she's you know, centrally located here in Santa Cruz. You know, Santa Cruz, just speaking of recovery, y'all lost over 900 homes. Um, we have, it's not when, I mean, if it's when a debris flow happens, you know, there's potentially some rain coming up this weekend. And, you know, that's uh, something we have to be in, in front of. Uh, we have set up several uh, task forces here in the state uh, to include watershed task force. And I've asked, um, uh, Mr. Bob Troy to set up a call with the county with all task force leads and that should happen tomorrow the next day with each individual county to start with uh, a, uh, uh, to start here in this uh, particular county. Just bring this up in this little chart here. It used to have actual days under it and I told everyone to remove that because people start getting stuck with day 90 and they think they're over the hump. Um, uh, you know, before uh, COVID, I mean, I mean, before the fires with COVID, with civil unrest, we had PSPS, we had extreme heats. Um, and it's just, it's just a very unrelenting year, I think is the best way to say it. And it's only October. 
fire season is not done. The waters, uh, the rainy season is about to begin. Um, and we have a lot to do, particularly in the short term. In this particular map, I would say we're in between the short term and intermediate. Um, this is probably the first time here in California that we moved as fast with recovery during the response uh, days. One thing I was, when, when I was appointed to come here and uh, help out the uh, state of California, one thing I made clear is recovery starts day minus 180 from a disaster. We should be in preparedness. We should be working with everyone here for those mitigation efforts. Uh, uh, and, and this is just a testament of that. In long term, you know, it's, you know, it, there's a lot of interest in phase two debris and uh, when's phase one going to be over and then the needle is going to move to housing. I will say housing, the needle right here is uh, from zero to 100. It's probably five or 10 because when it gets to housing, it just pegs at 100 and it's just, it's unforgiving. Uh, housing is very political. Uh, it's very personal and it's something that we have to be out in front of. And we're working closely with the federal Quayton and uh, officer to get to try to turn some programs on like direct housing and others for your constituents here in this beautiful county of Santa Cruz. One thing we've done here in California, we started in 18, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Troy, is you know, we, we had the California Disaster Recovery Framework. Uh, we had the, re the recovery support functions, which was on the previous slide. And when I, came, when I got here last year, I made all that operational. Before it was like this standalone planning section, and to me it made zero sense. So we put that under operations and they actually report through ops who reports up to me to ensure things are moving rapidly uh, uh, and we stay lock, step and barrel with the county and we don't get in front of uh, anyone. Uh, we were so dedicated to this effort. Uh, I can say the Federal Emergency Management Agency is starting to even look at that model for a national model. And, and two, I was able to get another uh, position within Cal OES um, to have assistant directors focus solely on long-term recovery. And I'm glad to say uh, the, the gentleman next to me, Bob Troy, uh, we were able to uh, recruit for that position. Uh, he applied and I'm confident uh, we have uh, uh, the best long-term recovery person in the U.S., not just California, in the entire U.S. He's dedicated uh, to you, he's dedicated to us, and like Kendra, he'll be here uh, throughout this process. This process will not be months. You don't build a town in a year, you you're not gonna rebuild it in a year, uh, but we hope that we can at least uh, uh, stay in front with you, eliminate or alleviate any risk or gaps, and if there's any risk or gaps, working with the county, they'll work through me, and we'll make sure we stay We'll stay in front of that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Troy. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Supervisors and Chair Caput. Um, so first of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, that, that uh, the recovery structure we just saw at the county level um, matches very well with state and federal doctrine. So thank you all for uh, adopting that. Um, it makes uh, everyone's uh, recovery uh, efforts more efficient when we speak. The, we have a common structure and a common language to begin with from which to start. And of course, um, to craft then craft the recovery efforts of Santa Cruz to fit the needs of Santa Cruz, but to start from a common a common place is, is certainly beneficial. With the graphic in front of us, really the key point is, as Ryan said, is that um, recovery really ideally should um, begin prior to the event. And if you look at the top line there, that's called the National Disaster Recovery Framework, and that's the concept that recovery is always here. Unfortunately, we are almost, we're almost always recovering from the last disaster, uh, and it's still in place as we move into the next disaster. Um, so that's a, it's a concept that we bring forward that recovery doesn't have a starting point and an end point. Um, we, you can see also we have the response framework, and as Ryan said, we're concurrently, uh, where we're winding down response, but also um, you know working recovery at the same time. So that's a process that will be ongoing. Um, and um, you know our, what we pledge here today is state and federal partnership with the County of Santa Cruz to support your recovery for the, the months and years to come. Next slide, please. Um, this next graphic I get is a bit of an eye chart and I don't expect you to be able to read all the details on it. This is a model, a visual model, another way to kind of demonstrate um, the multiple lines of effort for an organized recovery effort. So on the left-hand side, you have the different lines of effort and structures to help support recovery for individuals and households of Santa Cruz. 
Um, and so there are the different elements there, whether it's financial or whether it's housing or other types of recovery needs. And then on the right side, um, we have the structure, which is based off of those recovery support functions um, to identify the needs of the community or the governmental level, right? And so whether it's the housing needs or whether it's concerns about um, debris, pl debris flow and the impact of the threat to human life or the threat to the water infrastructure for um, the County of Santa Cruz, there's a structure there to help us work together to help address that and support that as much as possible. And in the center um, is that recovery structure here based in, in Santa Cruz, right? And this is just, you know, notional of the different par uh, potential partners that need, um, that, you know, can be a part of that effort, right? It's certainly government um, and it's certainly, um, a f you know, effective feedback and partnership from the community, all other elements of the community as well. Next slide, please. Um, we're also fortunate within the state of California to have something called the State Supplemental Grant Program. And essentially, um, our FCO none will be speaking shortly about the Individual Assistance Program, but we're fortunate enough in California that if there are individuals that receive the maximum grant um, eligible under FEMA, we can also then help bolster that on the state side for up to $10,000 if somebody has maximized all the different elements of that. And, and we'll learn a little bit more about that, but just wanted to make people aware of that, that the state um, also tries to you know, partner with FEMA to help provide similar support to the survivors here. Next slide, please. Um, and this flow chart here, again, I don't expect people to re be able to read the details, um, but it's us trying to work to provide with our partners on FEMA, the FEMA and federal side to provide, to help um, the County of Santa Cruz navigate recovery here. Um, and a couple points that, I, a couple issues I'd like to point out, um, and FCO none will um, speak more to, is just as the individuals and households here in Santa Cruz apply for um, and register with FEMA, uh, a couple of things to bear in mind is it, even if they um, have insurance and they think they're fully insured, we still encourage them to apply for FEMA anyway, because what they may find later is that they're underinsured, or there may be elements that aren't covered, and we don't want them to, to be too late for them to register later. So it, we very much encourage people to go ahead and err on the side of registering. That those same registrations also drive eligibility for other types of federal recovery resources as well. That should we be fortunate enough that Congress appropriates disaster supplemental funds that may be driven by some of these registrations. So it's critical that everybody within, even if their home wasn't destroyed, um, with everybody that's been affected by this disaster in Santa Cruz, please register with FEMA. It drives a lot of different um, elements of recovery. And then the second issue that we'd like to point out is even if somebody um, registers with FEMA and receives a denial letter that we really ask, and FCO9 will talk about this more, that they read the full letter and find out exactly what it is. Make, many times it's simply a case of uh, necessary documentation, and then there could be help to get that necessary documentation to get them to make them eligible for different types of assistance. So just because they receive a, a denial letter, letter to please read it, and there's a process for appealing place that, that we encourage people to utilize. Next slide, please. Could you slow down a little bit, please? You're, you're speaking really quickly, and it's hard Sure, sure, I'd be glad to. Next slide, please. So um, with this slide, I will go ahead and turn it over to Federal Coordinating Officer Nunn, who can talk a little more about these programs. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, Mr. Supervisors, and, and anyone on the, on the video. Um, as he said, my name is Willie Nunn. I'm the Federal Coordinating Officer, sir. And when this disaster was declared on the 22nd of August, uh, August, I became the federal coordinating officer. Uh, Santa Cruz was included. We had uh, uh, the individual assistance at that time. And as my colleagues have said, you know, Santa Cruz, uh, up to this date, we have uh, over almost 5,000 folks who have registered for Santa Cruz. And it's important that they register because that gets them into the system. And so looking at the sequence of delivery, uh, calling that registration number, uh, registering on the mobile app, uh, doing it online, however they can do it, we want to make sure that they do that. And I'll speak to that a little bit more later. But once they register for the individual assistance pro program, we have grants. And in the, we have a grant, and that grant is 35500 as the max grant. But we also have rental assistance as well, which is not is included in that max grant. If you, if, you, uh, if you qualify for rental assistance, uh, that can go up to 18 months for rental assistance. However, uh, uh, individual assistance, uh, individual and household and household assistance program, that is a maximum grant that goes up to uh, 35,500. As I talk about those grants, 
Uh, uh, to date, we have about $4.1 million already been approved. Um, we also uh, just want to let you know, uh, our average award in this county has been about $5,262. Um, and when we start talking about, uh, I, I do understand that there are about 900 plus homes destroyed in Santa Cruz County. So far in our registration, out of those 5,000, we have verified 80, uh, 80 destroyed homes, which was 37 owners and 43 renters. And that is why that registration number uh, is very important. That 1-800-621-3362 number is important because the next mission is to call back. As Mr. As Mr. Troy said, when folks get that determination letter, it's not denial letter, it's a determination letter. Please read it thoroughly because that determination may need one thing, as Troy said, may just need one thing that you have to correct and it gives you, uh, may make you eligible for, for assistance from us. And so it's important to one, if you got a question, call back. Two, if you get a determination letter, please read it through and you may answer one question and you may qualify. Uh, and you also have an opportunity to appeal. And we also have, we work with our partner SBA, uh, uh, Small Business Administration, and they will talk a little bit at the end. But to, in order to, uh, to get assistance beyond my grant, uh, you must go through the SBA process in which it's, and once you go through that, you may qualify for other needs assistance that can also go towards that max grant. And I want to emphasize that that 35,500 grant does not make people whole. We understand that. But it also gets them into the system and gets them along the way to uh, survival, uh, to back on the road to, to recovery. And we want them to utilize that. And as, it, as my colleague said, once they go through our and max out on our side of the house, uh, they're as fortunate that we have the state side of the house as a max grant for that as well. But I go back to uh, determining what those 5,000, almost 5,000 registrants mean for Santa Cruz County. Uh, that's where we get our numbers. That's what we determine uh, is that, can we uh, do a direct housing mission? So that's it's important that the citizens call back, make sure that they um, uh, get a determination on where they are. And I, and I also say uh, from the, from the uh, we also call out ourselves back to survivors if they have an unknown uh, 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 marker on their, on their registration, we called them to ask them questions as well. So it's a two-way street. The bottom line, as you said in the market at the bottom of the slide, we gotta keep in touch. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh. <laughs> Good working. And I'll, and I'll close my part with sir is, 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 uh, is disaster assistance. I must say, uh, we, uh, yesterday there were only 17 <coughs> countywide folks that registered yesterday up to the fourth. So it's slowing down to registration. That means most of the population has registered. However, that uh, I just can't uh, sympathize enough to say enough, call back if you've got questions. Our, num our, our call center is open from 7 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. Uh, specific time. And normally our answer has been less than a minute. If people start having problems with that, I'll make sure that uh, I get with the call center to make sure that we're answering questions after them promptly. Um, and we also, uh, we, we assisted with the local assistance center that was here in town. Uh, we still have registration folks on the other side of the street in the parking lot. They will be there through the 21st. Um, uh, but we, we still wanna encourage people to contact us to make sure that we're having all that's in need. So pending question at the end, sir, thank you for the opportunity and uh, standing by for next. So I think our next speaker is Kevin Wynn from SBA who will be uh, speaking remotely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Knight. Good morning, supervisors. After floods, earthquakes, hurricanes, wildfires, and other disasters, SBA disaster loans are the primary source of federal assistance to help private property owners pay for disasters not covered by insurance. SBA disaster loans are available to businesses of all sizes, private nonprofit organizations, homeowners, and renters. 
When disaster survivors need to borrow to repair damage, the low interest rates and long terms available from Small Business Administration make recovery affordable. A disaster loss is unexpected. For most disaster survivors, it is beyond their means to pay for disaster damages with their own resources without a hardship. The law gives SBA several powerful tools to make disaster loans affordable. Our low interest rates, long terms up to 30 years, and refinancing of prior liens in some cases. SBA's disaster loans are a critical source of economic stimulation in disaster ravaged communities, helping to spur employment and stabilize tax bases. And as Mr. Dunn said, and I will emphasize this, register, register, register everyone in Santa Cruz County, both renters, homeowners, private nonprofits and business owners should register with FEMA, get that, pro get that federal recovery process going. SBA disaster loans. We offer disaster loans for primary residences up to $200,000 to repair or replace. For homeowners and renters, up to $40,000 to repair or replace your personal property. For businesses, we offer up to $2 million at low interest rates to repair or replace the physical damage of a business, including machinery and equipment, inventory, supplies, and those things that go along with businesses. We also offer economic injury disaster loans, not only in Santa Cruz County, but in the contiguous counties that touch Santa Cruz County. These are working capital loans to help small businesses, small agricultural cooperatives, and most private nonprofit organizations meet their ordinary and necessary financial obligations that cannot be met as a result of the disaster. SBA looks at three criteria that you are in a declared county, that you have a credit history worthy to the accept and acceptable to the SBA, and that you have a repayment ability to repay all the loans. Current interest rates are for home loans and renters 1.1% and business loans are 3%. As I mentioned, terms up to 30 years makes recovery very affordable. Almost 80% of loans go to homeowners and renters and declare disaster from the Small Business Administration. A couple other things that SBA does offer once you're approved into the program is that we can refinance your current mortgage and bring you into the 1.1% interest rate to help you meet repayment ability. We also offer terms in which you can relocate as well should you decide to get out of the disaster zone also. Some of the current numbers are we have, as of 7 a.m. this morning, approved $17.5 million. And Santa Cruz County is bearing the brunt of that. Almost $9 million have been approved in SBA disaster loans for Santa Cruz County only. 77 homes for $8.8 .8 million. And six businesses have been approved for over $200,000. SBA, as you can see on the screen where you can go to apply, Register with FEMA, as Mr. Nunn said. Register, register, register. We can't emphasize that enough. That opens the entire federal recovery process. Once you're in with FEMA, they'll refer you over to the SBA to fill out an application. And once you're into the SBA, we've got a lot of programs in which to help you on the road to recovery. There's our 800 number on the screen, 800-659-2955. You can also email us at focwestassistance at sba.gov and I will be available as well to answer questions following the presentations. Um, thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, Kevin. So that it concludes our prepared presentation for today and everyone on the panel is it would welcome any questions from the board. You bet. Uh, we can start the uh, questions. Uh, <clears throat> Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Chair, and I'd just like to thank our state and federal partners for taking so much time to not just be here, but to also provide us with designated people within our community and to commit to being here for the long term. I think that not only did we experience a disaster, um, as was noted by our state partners, uh, it's not with, uh, if, but when we're going to have our next disaster in regards to the debris flow. 
but we're also early in our disaster season in regards to other issues uh, throughout the entire county. And so we know that um, our county has a history of natural disasters. Having these points of contact specifically designated for our area with people that have that knowledge is really essential. And so I just wanted to appreciate the fact that you've, you've made that dedication in that time. I know that we have an item on our agenda um, following this that, that uh, deals with the creation of potentially of of a more designated team internally as well, and how that will interface uh, with the state and national delegation would be important for me to also understand and hear. But uh, a lot of this is just a gratitude component to know that our local constituents have these points of contact locally and that you're committed to being here for the long term from both a staffing and funding perspective. So thank you for that. Okay, uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I want to thank, uh, like Supervisor Friend mentioned, our partners here. Uh, this is going to be a team effort of federal, state, and local uh, in order to get people the resources they need, both in the short term, but also over the long term. Uh, I have two particular questions that I wanted to focus on today. I've appreciated uh, the responsiveness uh, of this team to the questions as they come up. The first is for Cal OES. Uh, we're looking for phase two approval. Um, we have a lot of people uh, waiting to find out about that stage of debris removal. Um, and I'm wondering when we might have a timeline and um, what kind of debris may be included in that removal process. Thank you for that uh, question, Supervisor. This is uh, Ryan Buras. Uh, we're still working closely with FEMA. I'm confident. Well, let me back up a little bit. Um, phase two. Uh, you know, when this starts, you know, there's a lot of complexities that happen even before that approval letter and that's already happening. So I don't want you to think or anyone in this room to think that we're waiting on some permission from FEMA to be looking, uh, uh, working with our partners at Cal Recycle, working on the contracts. Our team, you know, diligently worked on the contracts last week. So as soon as this approval is received from our federal partners, we can quickly get on that, that on the street. Um, you know, timelines are always difficult. Uh, uh, of when you know when things start, I can tell you you know uh, we have a very short time frame to get this debris gone. Uh, we have a lot of counties to get this debris moving, and we really want to focus on some areas first, particularly with watershed issues like here in Santa Cruz. So there's a lot of things happening. As you know, Phase One started last week with the United States of EPA. I do want to thank my partners at uh, the federal government to allow that to happen with so many counties impacted. Our partners at Department of Toxic and Substance just didn't have the capacity to be throughout the state of California removing debris. So I'm glad that started uh, here, particularly in some of the areas that are tough too. As far as what's going to be uh, uh, removed, I'm assuming you're, you're speaking about vehicles and, and other things to that nature. We're still working closely with FEMA on the, on the vehicle side. I did um, you know, drive and understand that you know, vehicles are gonna be an issue. Uh, regardless who pays for it, uh, these things are burnt uh, uh, and, and they have to be removed uh, for the recovery of Santa Cruz to, to occur. So we'll work closely, regardless what uh, FEMA's approval is, uh, we'll work closely uh, with other state partners, including uh, the county here to see what we can do to assist uh, on that. As far as all the other debris should be removed, uh, slabs is a little different uh, story. We're working closely on that. Uh, and I'm confident over the next week or so, we'll have some information back from FEMA uh, and that we can report out to the Board of Supervisors. I just don't want to get too ahead of the approval letter uh, for that. But I will say that we're constantly in meetings with FEMA. We have a great relate working relationship with our Regional 9 office. Uh, we have a wonderful FCO here. And this is something that every single day I'm on the phone with is, is focusing on, 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 on the, the uh, debris mission here. And I will say the branch director here that we've uh, brought on board and also we have Brian Baker behind me from Haggerty, who's been his expertise and in, in, in that consultant firm helping us get the right people in place for this county. But Kendra Boy has been doing debris as a contractor, now as a state employee, removed a lot of the, the uh, debris down south, which is similar to the complexities we're going to have in Santa Cruz. So we wanted to make sure that we had somebody that was seasoned and removing very difficult debris here. So I hope that answered your question somewhat. Uh, yeah, I think. Uh... Just let us, I understand that once we get approval, it's still going to take um, Well, he, I think he's still talking. It's just his connection is. Uh, 
uh, Supervisor uh, Cooper. Yeah. We lost you there, so you might want to repeat your comment. Uh, 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 we'll uh, we'll go to uh, we'll come back to you if you want, uh, Supervisor McPherson. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I want to just uh, repeat the. Thanks to FEMA and OES for their cooperative efforts and their team effort for to get this done. Uh, here at home, I'm just holding up the with a former uh, framework of part of a tractor that I saw when I went up to San Lorenzo Valley. That's what it looks like, and it was all over the place. And this is some of the materials that they're going to be removing. Unbelievable of how hot that fire was, but that's part of a tractor frame right there. But I, I want to also repeat the thanks to them and also to give thanks to our own uh, departments in uh, human care, water, transportation, and economics uh, for what they've done. Um, and I also want to add, too, that our state representatives, Assemblymember um, Stone, uh, Senator Monning, uh, Congress members uh, Eshu and Panetta have been really great in our communications that we've had with them. And they are doing what they can to address this issue. It's a, we know that this is a statewide issue now. It's over 4 million acres, the size of Connecticut. But uh, we, I can just assure um, our residents that our members that are in the state legislature in Congress uh, have our ear. So that is really good to hear. Um, I think the, the takeaway from this is uh, be sure to register with FEMA, and I guess that is open until October 21st. I believe that's the deadline. They need a deadline so they can see, okay, this is the framework we have to work with and what we're doing. So people, be sure to register if you are in need. And I do appreciate the welcoming that we've had from OES and FEMA. It's been a great team effort and um, it's a long haul, but it's gonna be a good team that we're gonna get this done and help as many people as we can as soon as possible. I think it's important for people to know that there is a structure, there's a time, there's a phase one, there's a phase two. Uh, that's difficult for some people to comprehend or, or uh, understand, but uh, it is the way that uh, we need to work to get the hazardous materials first and then work on uh, the, the other uh, remaining materials that are uh, laying out there for as a result of this disastrous fire. So thank you to OES and FEMA and to all of our representatives in uh, the state and federal levels. Chair, we might wanna see if Supervisor Coonerty wants to make any final remarks. Okay. Yes, thank you, I'm back on. Um, I, I apologize, I don't know why every time I wanna speak, the internet goes down. Anyway, um, so I guess uh, first, Thank you for your response and let us know what we can do to accelerate phase two. Um, as, as you know, uh, once we get approval, it takes time to get the contracts and staging and everything else. And we're worried about rains and debris flow and getting people back to their lives. So we wanna make that go as fast uh, as possible. The second question is a sec as a, for a smaller community, this community of Davenport, it's a 300 people in their, their own water district We've had to truck in uh, water since this, uh, since the beginning of the incident because the fire line burned out um, uh, and I'm, we're seeking FEMA reimbursement for that community, for that, for that trucked in water. Um, if we don't get the reimbursement, it'll be a, a huge financial burden because that cost would be uh, only on those small group of people. So um, whatever we can do to support uh, FEMA reimbursement for uh, for that community as they as they get the water they need just to live um, is uh, would would be appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Thank Supervisor, you. just one comment. I'll make sure uh, that's the first I've heard of the the shipping in the water. So I'll make sure that my my team is uh, loop, looped in with Willie's team. And you know, water is essential. It's one of those lifelines. Uh, so I'll work closely with this uh, with the federal uh, government to ensure whatever we can do uh, to ensure that's reimbursed properly, uh, and 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 also to get any sort of fast fix, uh, and that we can work with you all as well in that. So, 
Okay. And Mr. Supervisor, I'll just add, um, that community is uh, under, under the program of Category B in our public assistance program. And that's, that's something we work closely with the, with the state and with that area to make sure that they can potentially get reimbursed. Right. Right. And, and the only other Thank thing- Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Yes, sir. And the only other thing I would like to add, I was remiss to say, we also have people here in the county uh, with a, I have a division supervisor and a branch director to go one for one uh, with our with our counterparts and to make sure that we're lockstep with the with the state and with the county. Okay. Great, uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I really appreciate it. Very early in uh, this disaster, the director Galaducci was here to tell us that there would that that OES would would, would be here for us would. Uh, would stand with us and having dedicated staff member who will be here uh, will be certainly helpful. I also appreciate the contribution of FEMA. Um, uh, the, having dedicated staff also makes a big difference. Um, Santa Cruz is a very small county, but this is the 11th most destructive fire in California's history um, because of the large number of homes that we lost uh, comparatively also to our, to the just, um, uh, stock of housing that we have. So your assistance with debris removal and assistance with funding so we can work as quickly as possible to move people back into their homes will go a long way to not only helping those uh, roughly thousand uh, families, but actually the entire county because the impact that has on our housing stock. So I appreciate you being here. I appreciate the collaboration you have with the county. And um, I, I uh, would expect that we will continue good relations as we move through this, through all the difficult phases of uh, rebuilding and recovery. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I noticed uh, there, well, we, we've had like uh, uh, 950 approximately uh, homes that have been destroyed. And the report showed, I guess, that 80 have uh, actually come forward for assistance. Uh, are some just dealing with their insurance company and they won't go to FEMA or they won't go to state for aid? Or how does that work? Uh, sir, it may be more than 80 have come for FEMA. Those are the 80 verified that we have destroyed right now. Sure. And that is the reason for the call back, for the survivors to call back. And that's also the reason for us to call them if, if their registration is unknown. If we have a question from them that could put them in the category of destroyed or major damage or minor damage. And so that is one of the big purposes of call back. And so that number may go up um, from, 80, from, from 80 to uh, whatever number it comes out to, depending on the call back of the survivors. Okay. Yes, sir. And uh, I did get one phone call from somebody uh, that was mentioning they didn't have any insurance on the home. Uh, is FEMA gonna <laughs> be able to, uh, you know, I don't know how much of it is uh, true as far as, uh, uh, I guess a few homes can be uninsurable, uh, something to the effect insurance companies won't insure certain homes in certain areas or something like that, I don't know. Uh, understand when that, when that survivor calls in and, and they, they uh, let us know that they don't have insurance and then we go through their whole, whole uh, uh, process with them to determine if whatever we can give them. And again, unfortunately, uh, a grant is only 35,500 max grant for household assistance, home, household assistance and rental assistance if they can, if they qualify, that can go up to 18 months. So we can assist in that respect. But if once they call and they say they don't have insurance, that puts them in a whole new category. And so they should continue to make sure that they get their case to us. And, and that person, all they have to do is when they call back, make sure that they give their registration number. And, and uh, as, right. as, our, as our person on the phone will be talking to them through what they're eligible for. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, can I just follow up on that, Chair? Um, if it's an unpermitted home, would that fall into the same category? You know, we, we, in, some, in some of these places, there are homes that may not have been fully permitted. 
And, and that unfortunate that, you know, that goes with, along with what the local requirements are, uh, of what the uh, um, home ownership, uh, going with home ownership. But if they go proof of ownership and we go through that whole case study, we can determine whether what they, what they qualify, sir. And that's something we can assist you all with. I mean, you know, part of recovery after disaster is telling the story and everybody has an individual story. Yeah. We have to make sure that we capture that. We have to make sure that we put it in a, in a place uh, that we can put it into a federal regulation that's a bonded, that's a, that, that the FCO is bonded by so we can get certain things approved. Also, you know, speaking to people that are uninsured, I mean, let's, you know, unfortunately this is a disaster and even people with insurance are gonna be underinsured or not insured and there's gonna be a lot of gaps here. So the more that we know what that story is here for Santa Cruz. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people in the U.S. that want to help, whether it's voluntary agencies or whatnot, and we do coordinate a lot of this effort. So, uh, the more that you can let us know and, and we can assist, and you know, we have a, y'all have a wonderful district, wonderful electeds, you know, wonderful uh, county. I think we can get a lot done here very rapidly. I would like to say I was speaking to FEMA yesterday, speaking of recovery, and you know, we have mitigation dollars that we have every year and counties apply for it and we get it approved. I do want to meet uh, with your uh, leadership here in the county to look at some potential mitigation projects that we don't have to wait for a year or two to discuss. Let's actually get something approved, like look, something that you and I, the state and, and, and the locals can agree to. I can work closely with FEMA Region 9. Let's get money on the street now that we know that's coming in, not have to wait a year, particularly if it's gonna be a life sustaining project on watershed or et cetera. So I look forward to those conversations with your team. <coughs> my, my last comment, but you don't have to answer it, uh, is uh, we're still in a critical fire uh, situation. If another fire breaks out, uh, we might have you guys back here. Uh, hopefully not, but <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, October with uh, everything being dry, uh, it, another fire could start very easily. Okay. Uh, we'll open it up to the public for public comment. Uh, each person will have between two and three minutes. Uh, if we can make it fairly quick here, we can get through this. Wait, you probably want to give uh, clear information to the uh, to the clerk about two or three minutes. Should it be two or three minutes as they set the clock? Uh, okay, we'll yeah, we'll get those comments too. Two minutes. Uh, we'll go first. And how 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 long how, do you want public comment to be? Do you want it for two minutes or do you want it for three minutes? Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, are you going to take uh, Becky? Do you need all of three minutes? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I would appreciate three. All right, go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in rural Aptos. My home and my area was not affected by the fire, but many of my friends were and have lost their homes. Their homes were model places for fire defensible space and their home burned to the ground. So I have some questions and um, I want to know if uh, FEMA and the state will help support uh, financial assistance for erosion control measures that these people can take around their properties to secure them for the winter and hopefully prevent debris flows and to um, protect the, the watershed and other areas of their property and property owners downstream, downhill. I want to know, um, if FEMA and the state will help support small water companies like the San Lorenzo Valley Water District that has suffered extreme hardship and um, needs help desperately. I hope so. Um, one issue about the insurance is that insurance cancellations have been a huge problem in this county. And many people were in transition. I've been getting uh, messages from people who had just had their insurance canceled. And so they were in transition looking for others. What about those people? And um, 
some people are still getting notices of cancellation from their insurance companies. And I think that's illegal. So I hope that you will look into that and encourage Commissioner Laura to really nail down on these insurance companies because it is illegal for one year to cancel anybody. I hope that the insurance companies just don't um, run around that and increase policy uh, costs to the point that they are unaffordable. Um, I wonder what, uh, regarding, uh, I, I'm surprised with 5,000 people who have been verified that only 80 have uh, fallen into the category of having lost their homes. I would like to ask the supervisors in these districts to please reach out to everybody in your district and make sure that you get this information. Supervisor McPherson has been doing a stellar job with his newsletter, but I don't know how, uh, how far reaching those are. And many people have had to leave the area entirely because they have no place to go. Um, I want to know if um, FEMA and the state will cover replacement costs and repair of communication towers. There have been some amateur radio towers that were completely devastated that provided huge emergency communication service to this area. They're gone, as well as some of the county's infrastructure. I want to know um, if people are going to be forced to relocate and if your funding will predicate them relocating in order to get any money if the county deems that they can't go back to their property. And finally, I want to know how your money would cover livestock, not necessarily for businesses, but for people's livelihoods. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is James Ewing Whitman. I won't need three minutes. Uh, it's just great that we can all sit and look at each other and listen to what's going on and that it's been recorded. What is it from the slides? About 5,000 individuals have reached out to FEMA to get some assistance. I think that that's fabulous. That's about 140th of the population of Santa Cruz County and Santa Cruz County is one ten thousandth of the population of the world. There's a lot of things going on and I'm not really quite sure what to say, but the ability for the government to help who they choose to help and the ways that they help them is truly fabulous. I wonder if there's how many other strings are attached to this. Uh, I wish that I had taken some notes on some stuff I was listening to before about some kind of, you know, you get a loan from FEMA, they actually, now they own your house, they're the bank. Um, just where are we headed this winter? I mean, I started hinting about things as soon as there was a supervisor's meeting after the fire started. And the next day after that, it was not, the fire wasn't mentioned at all. And I don't know what day that was. Maybe that was August 21st or 22nd. But the next day, a national emergency was declared. And a few weeks later, we had fires all over the West Coast. Now, you know, I've spoken about what's going on with these fires. I didn't have an opportunity to personally go up to places I used to live until a couple weeks ago, but I took pictures of the houses that were still standing and the two buildings that I lived in that were burned to the ground in a very interesting way that is really quite unnatural. Um, I guess what I wanna say is there's a lot of information about how Lloyds of London will not cover any insurance claims for wireless damages and that's, I believe, to property and to persons. So I'll close in saying that although I have literally hundreds of links, this one from CNN is really quite interesting. Uh, it refers to 60 gigahertz, which is, yeah, it, which is just a frequency, and part of 5G, which is over 3,000 frequencies, is a weapon. It, it describes on CNN in 1985 how the militaries are using lightning as weapons. It talks about the different frequencies and how they can affect almost any mood in a human being like a pharmaceutical pill. Um, so it's just interesting to observe what's going on and I wonder what's gonna be going on this winter. So I guess that's enough for now, thank you. We have, yeah. Yeah. Well, hold on, we have some additional comments. We have three web comments. The first one is from Lee Samuels. The Human Care Alliance would like to have a representative attend meetings around disaster recovery efforts and coordination that affect 
and involve nonprofits. Please let us know who should we be in touch with. Thank you, Lee Samuels. The second one is from Christina Salinas. When do you think the public will have the info for phase two cleanup plan for the 925 homes that have burned in the Santa Cruz mountains? I understand you are planning stages and are developing this plan. And the third comment is from Ken Davenport. I agree with Supervisor McPherson and Coonerty's proposal. If FEMA won't cover the total cost of new positions, reallocate non-essential county workers to these positions. And that's the end of public comment. Thank you. Your microphone's not on. I'll bring it back to the board. Well, I don't think there's any action. We're just considering the presentation. I just want to thank you for, uh, for, for your work and I look forward to the continued partnership. Okay. Uh, do we need a, uh, a vote on this? No, Supervisor uh, Caput, okay. there is no it vote. Does say here. Okay. Hey, uh, I'm just curious, where'd you have to come from to get here? Either one. Um, from like where I was born or? Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. No, Sacramento. So we drove from Sacramento. My office is in Sacramento, right. California. Um, he works in uh, Sacramento as well. We drove, uh, we got here last night around midnight and uh, I'm just welcome to be here. And I, once again, just uh, thanks for, uh, I really do appreciate the partnership, but thank you. But, and how about yourself? Yes, sir. I, I work in Sacramento uh, alongside them, uh, deployed this is the Sacramento and I drove okay. down this morning. Great. Yes, sir. Thank you. Welcome. Yes, sir. All right. That concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, should we take a little break? You're, you're welcome to take a break at this point. Okay, we'll take a 10 minute break. 10 minutes. Okay, and then we'll come right back. Mr. Nunn. Uh, we'll start with uh, item number eight, consider the estate. Supervisor, your microphone. I'm on. You, you can't hear me? It's, it's on. There we go. Now you can? Okay. Consider the establishment of a county office of recovery and resilience, ORR, in the county administrative office. Uh, to coordinate the county's response to the CZU August Lightning Complex fire, respond to future disasters, and increase resiliency of the county overall in response to climate change, direct the CAO to return in November uh, 10th, 2020, with the funding recommendation and take related action as outlined in the memorandum of supervisors Coonerty and McPherson. And if we can have the presentation, uh, uh, will, it, will it take long, uh, Supervisor Coonerty and McPherson? Hi, Mr. Chair, this is uh, Ryan Coonerty. I can briefly introduce this item if you wish. Okay. Uh, so, uh, this is in obviously as it relates to the this fires, but it's really about accepting a new reality that we're in where we're going to have more intense storms, droughts, fires, um, and really trying to both build a system to recover quickly, um, to coordinate across different departments. Um, so we don't have issues where we have different departments giving conflicting information and where we can get answers to, to property owners or residents who have been displaced quickly. And then also, as was mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, there's FEMA hazard mitigation money available. Um, there's likely a resiliency bond coming from the state of California. Uh, hopefully there's a change in Washington, DC, and we have a real investment in climate adaptation uh, and a green new deal. Um, in all those ways, we really need to have our community um, prepare for this new reality and make sure that we have the systems in place, uh, that we're applying for appropriate grants and building community support, 
that we're looking at places where we're vulnerable and we can make a big uh, impact with a little uh, public and, and or pr public private investment. Um, so it's it's really trying to look at what we can do to prepare for the future. Um, this is a model that we've uh, taken from Sonoma County, uh, who established this after their first fire. Since then, they've had more fires, more floods. Uh, they have a fire going right now. And what we heard from their supervisors was this was an incredibly important way um, to help uh, speed recovery uh, for not only the current disaster, but future disasters, as well as start to plan and work with the community to build resiliency. Um, this is a smaller effort than what they've uh, established because we have a difficult budget situation, but we think that this is a good investment and use of our time. And then finally, I just wanna clear up one thing uh, County Council brought to our attention, uh, which is that uh, we need to change one of the recommendations to <laughs> um, be clear that the board committee would be an ad hoc committee to monitor and oversee implementation of the county's recovery and resilience work related uh, for the duration of tw uh, 2021. And that Supervisor McPherson and, uh, and myself would be uh, uh, would be on that. And then obviously we'd want to uh, look at a governance structure going forward and getting other supervisors um, on that committee if, if um, and hopefully it doesn't happen, but if there are events uh, or resiliency projects in their districts that they want to work on. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. We're uh, doing the a coordination effort with uh, the Sonoma County counterparts, in particular Supervisor James Gore, who even on a national level has uh, been known uh, to address this, this issue of uh, resiliency and recovery from the many experiences Sonoma County had, and they just experienced in another one. I think they've had five in the last four years, in fact. Uh, but they were very clear to us that uh, having a full-time dedicated staff to manage this recovery and rebuilding process was critical in creating a culture uh, of trust and understanding that we can have between the county and our residents. Um, we know that there's going to be a financial impact, some of which will be reimbursable, but we really can't afford to get it wrong either. And the livelihood of our residents are at stake, and we collectively manage as we collectively manage our efforts, so we're going to be better for it. Um, I can't overstate the importance of the resiliency aspect of this. We are not just working on recovery from this one event, and this county has had several over the the you know the years. Uh, but we are laying the groundwork here for being more prepared for the next disaster as well. Uh, should it be a mudslide or wildfire or extreme weather events uh, driven by climate change? Uh, uh, it's upon us. Uh, we want to address it as directly and uh, compassionately as we can to serve the, our residents as best we can. And with that, after <clears throat> we've heard from other board members and the public, I'd, I'd be prepared to make a motion to accept this recommendation with the uh, uh, modification that was mentioned by Supervisor Coonerty. And it's, I just want to say that I, I can't say enough for our staffs that we have had, uh, Rachel Dan in uh, Supervisor Coonerty's office and Andy Schifrin, J.M. Brown and Jenny Johnson and my staff and the CAO's office uh, and the agencies throughout Public Works in particular and planning. Uh, I just can't overstate how much I appreciate it. We all appreciate the cooperative effort and the directness we want to go about uh, to make this recovery effort as quickly as we can and i hope that uh, we uh, our our residents here have some patience but with that we're going to try to get at it as quickly as we can to serve you in the best way we can um, and uh, i'd just like to hear some comments from the public for what they have but i'm really excited about this effort that we're going to, about to endeavor thank you you're welcome Okay, any uh, questions or comments from board members? Uh, Su Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, 
First of all, I'm very supportive of, of this idea. I think this board just a year ago actually voted to establish a climate action manager because we saw the, the, the dangers of climate change and its effect on our community and that we needed to start adapting and figuring out those adaptation strategies. We started the hiring process, but we put it on hold uh, when, uh, when the COVID affected our budget as badly as it did. Um, but over this past year, it's really seemed to me as I've looked into it that we really, that we're really talking about resiliency and it's, uh, that's always was a key part of that. And so I'm glad to see this uh, moving forward. I'm gonna support uh, this uh, measure uh, because I think it's important for us to not only support uh, the thousands of people who've been affected uh, by these fires, but prepare our county uh, for the resilience necessary to be able to deal with uh, what might be a regular part of our lives because of extreme weather events. Um, if you would have said even 10 years ago that we would, uh, that we would have the 11th most destructive fire, that we would have uh, storm damage that would take up half of all the damage to the state of California in a storm, um, if, uh, even if you said that we would be uh, suffering $26 million from a tsunami, all those things seemed inconceivable just 10 years ago. And um, in, the, in the past 10 years, they've all come true. And so we need to start preparing our community uh, to be as resilient as possible. Um, and I think that there will be uh, resources at both the state level and the federal level as policymakers at those, at, at those air levels of government start recognizing that we have got to prepare. We can't just uh, endlessly recover and do things the same. We have to, we have to think about how we strengthen um, our communities and build the infrastructure necessary to protect ourselves. Uh, I did have one question, uh, just a sort of a technical question. It says that this would uh, direct the CAO to appoint a full-time manager. And is, is, can we appoint someone? Do we have to go through a hiring process? Are we gonna go to the, to the list of people who applied for the job before? I mean, what's, what's the sense about that? So uh, Supervisor Leopold, we're, we're looking at staff internally within the county. Um, there have been uh, a few individuals who we've thought of who may be able to serve in that role. Um, so we're looking internally. Um, we're also exploring, you know, how we might need to supplement that office with other positions potentially based on financial resources that might be available. But um, we're working on that and we'll be coming back with some recommendations to the board. Okay, because uh, this person would obviously part, be part of the civil service and everything like that. So I just Correct. didn't know, I didn't know whether we had to go through the hiring process or whether we can just appoint. If, if we end up ending hiring um, or establishing a new position, that would have to follow the civil service process, and we would, of course, have to come back to the board to, for any recommended actions and approvals. Okay, thank you. That's all I have, Chair. Okay. Any other questions, Supervisor <laughs> Friend? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson and Coonerty for uh, bringing this item forward. I am supportive of the creation. I do think that um, we've, uh, due to necessity, have already started down this framework with, as our last item with uh, Cal OES and FEMA showed, uh, with Director Machado and others, we, we've created this OES group within the CAO. And so I think that we've started down a process. I think that this helps formalize it, but I, I do believe that we can uh, take that talent internally that we have and, and break down the silos that we've been working on in the last couple of years to do, as Supervisor Leopold was mentioning, going down a direction not just of resiliency, but ensuring that this interplay between the departments, things don't get stuck between departments, but instead have uh, these positions within one place so that that communication and influence and outcome can occur without the silos is, is very important. I just want to ensure that the flexibility is left uh, to the CAO's office and those that are already operating in a, in a county OES structure to come back to us in the coming month or so, as I know that uh, the direction has a, a budget item coming back or, or a budget structure coming back to create this framework as well. I mean, I think that, that the board's job should be to uh, state that this is something we want. I think that, that there's universality on that, uh, but there should be flexibility within the county structure to determine exactly what that looks like within the 
CAO's office, uh, especially given our current budget constraints in the way that it is. And I think we do have a lot of internal talent that uh, can be used for this. But I am I am supportive, again, of the item, and I appreciate the work of Supervisor McPherson and Coonerty on this. Okay. <clears throat> we'll open it up to uh, public comment. And if we can, okay, hi. I think I want three minutes. Hi, uh, I, I listened to most of this, some of this outside. I just needed to t listen to some music because this is kind of daunting. Yes, we have this plan to take care of these things that are immediately upon us. It may have been June 23rd, 2020 that I, that I talked about this. Santa Cruz County Local Agenda 21, final draft, June 3rd, 1997. It came into this county March of uh, 1993, and the Board of Supervisors endorsed Agenda 21 proposal in January 1994. You know, I mentioned this because this really shouldn't be such a surprise about bringing people into the big cities and getting people out of the wilderness. It's not just happening. Santa Cruz County, it's happening all over the world. And this is a plan. Um, and I've spoken about, and you can verify this stuff, there's a lot of information. The, what I took pictures of, those are direct energy weapons. Now, since then, my learning curve has kind of improved a little bit because the RAND Corporation also has some uh, influence and ability to uh, use underground lightning and, and start underground fires. I have f photographs on my phone where there are root systems that have caught on fire and those root systems were put out and the rest of the tree is alive. That's fresh, that happened during this fire. So, you know, what was it? S Bush Senior, September 11th, 1991, talked about a new government plan for the entire world where everybody would get along according to the laws. And uh, that's the new world order. You know, it goes a lot further back than then. There are some leaders in the United States who have been profiting on both sides of the war. And what we're heading for is like a really serious Bolshevik winner. Um, these individuals funded Adolf Hitler, and that includes Prescott Bush, Rockefellers with Standard Oil, and many other people. So here I am wearing a mask, and boy, I chose the wrong thing, because this is thick, <laughs> this is hard to breathe out of. Um, and I guess if somebody wanted to grab me, I bet this thing would hold 2,000 pounds of force. So I'm here because I actually care, and I would much rather be talking about a lot of other things. I'm here because I'm selfish. I'd like to live another 40 years, and I don't think unless I speak out publicly that many people in this room are gonna be, and on the planet are gonna be around in 40 years because that's not part of the plan. So it's great that we're going over this stuff, but uh, it's really kind of sad what I see going on. And I wish I didn't have to come up here and I could talk about other things, but thank you very much because I've been stopped cold with this at the city of Santa Cruz talking about stuff. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, Becky. Hello, Chairman Caput. Thank you, my name is Becky Steinbrenner. I'm a resident of rural um, Santa Cruz County in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And the question I have about this is, how come we suddenly have money to start a whole new department, but we didn't have money to fund Rosemary Anderson's full-time position, the County Office of Emergency Services Manager? How come her job got cut? There was no money for that, but now there's suddenly money to create a whole new department. This makes no sense. I don't understand why, why this is happening. And I think that this very department should go back to the emergency services manager. They're the ones that are focused on planning and that's what this is all about, is planning. She did a great job planning and establishing the relationships that are critical when a disaster happens, that are critical in reaching out to the people. So why is her job cut? And here's a whole new department being established. It makes no sense. 
I uh, listened in last night on the Santa Cruz City Water uh, Commission, and they're going through much like this too with uh, trying to figure out what to do to plan for climate change. I suggest that rather than this county reinventing the wheel and the city of Santa Cruz Water Department reinventing the wheel, that the two partner, because it's all related, they're working with the University of Massachusetts to do some modeling that will help address various climate scenarios. Why don't we team up with them? They have a very interesting approach. Their, their point is vulnerability. When do we start worrying? What are the triggers that get us to start worrying? And when we're at those triggers, what action do we take? This is the, the level of information and, and action that planning that we need to be doing. And I think that the County Office of Emergency Services manager was doing a very good job of that. And there is no need to establish a whole new department to do that very thing that that one person and her assistant were doing very well. Um, I want to bring it now to the grand jury report because that uh, the ready aim fire Santa Cruz County in the hot seat. I read through those replies, those responses, and they were not at all um, substantive. And the one that talked about roadside mowing along evacuation routes, it, putting the, the onus back on the people. No, it's not that. The county has to fund it. Thank you for turning off my microphone, but, but this is serious business. And we need to put our money to helping people do the work. Thank you. Thanks for turning off my microphone. Thank you. And uh, let's see, any, any comments? We have no further comments. Yeah, uh, bring it back to the board. Uh, uh, the, the only question I have uh, is, is this replacing, we had a position uh, a few years ago and maybe right now, emergency uh, uh, response uh, manager or whatever. Uh, years, a couple of years ago, it was uh, I, I, Mr. I, I think Hobart. your microphone's not on, so we can't hear you. Yeah. S Supervisor Caput, your microphone. Here? Yeah. I think Supervisor McPherson wants we, to say something. Yeah, I want to make it clear that we're not establishing a new department. We're we're uh, doing this with personnel that we have now to be overseen, uh, be centered with this uh, administrative officer. But uh, this is not a new department. We are going to do this with existing personnel. And so I think that needs to be made clear. That answers the question. And uh, well, we'll entertain. We can entertain a motion if, unless we have other comments. I'd be glad to make a motion, Mr. Chair, that we accept this uh, proposal with a modification that was uh, mentioned by uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Okay. And second. Second. Okay, we got a first and second. If. Uh, the clerk will conduct, uh, conduct Supervisor the Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Chairman Caput? Aye. And the motion passes unanimously. Uh, takes us to item number nine, public hearing to consider report on the year 2021 growth goal. Refer the matter to the Planning Commission for consideration continue the public hearing to December 8, 2020 and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. Hello there. Good morning, Hi. supervisors. <laughs> My name is Natish Williams and today I'll be presenting on the year 2021. You might want to be school. closer to the microphone. Oh, sorry about that. Bring it, bring it closer to you. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so as you know, the county's growth management system was instituted in 1979 following the adoption of, the measure, of Measure J to address the resource and public services impacts of population growth in Santa Cruz County. As part of, as part of the growth management system, each year the county is... Sorry. Okay. We're just trying to make it as hard for you as possible. <laughs> 
Um, each year, the county is required to set an annual growth goal for the upcoming year that represents a fair share of the state's growth. The 2021 growth goal report is before you today for consideration prior to referral to the planning commission. So this report examines various factors used in establishing the year 2021 growth goal for the unincorporated area. And it includes analysis of population growth trends, resource constraints, and the status of this year's allocations. The report includes analysis of the county's housing needs, including progress towards meeting the county's required regional housing needs assessment, as well as demolition permits and density bonus projects approved in the past year. And the ADU annual report is also included. This year's report also includes a discussion on the permanent room housing project applications that, were, um, that are in process this year and the impacts of recent state law on the county's growth management system. As noted in the report, the unincorporated area of Santa Cruz County had an estimated negative 0.24% growth rate last year. All jurisdictions except Scotts Valley saw similar negative growth rates. The county as a whole has seen decline, declining population totals in recent years. And while the state's population continues to increase, California's growth rate has also slowed down in recent years. Recent population estimates for the county indicate a continuing downward trend of population growth rates in the decades since the 1960s and 70s, when the county grew much faster than the state. The 2020 census is, is expected to provide more precise and up-to-date population numbers for a county. However, the data is not set to be released until um, the spring of 2021 at the earliest. So if it's available in time, staff hopes to include these figures in next year's report. The growth goal report also summarizes the current status of the 2020 residential building permit allocations. This year, 63 allocations have been granted as of August 1st, including 45 units from six PRH projects, which are currently in process. If demand continues at the current rate, 76 allocations will be granted by the end of the year. If PRH units are not included, only 18 building permits have been allocated so far in 2020, compared to 42 building permit allocations at the same time last year. Demand for allocations has remained low compared to previous decades, and staff anticipates there will be more than enough permits available for the remainder of 2020. Based on the analysis detailed in the report, staff recommends that the growth goal be set at 0.25% for calendar year 2021. This would be consistent with the state's recent growth rates and constitutes our fair share of population growth as dictated by Measure J. This would result in an allocation of 131 market rate units available for the year 2021. Allocations will be distributed between the urban and rural areas of the, areas of the county at 75% to 25% ratio in order to recognize the greater poten potential for infill development in urban areas. The 2021 growth goal report also recommends as in previous years that the unused market rate allocations from 2020 be carried over to 2021 in accordance with policy 3.2 of the general plan housing element. This would result in a projected total of 310 market rate allocations available for 2021. Staff has found that the establishment of the 2021 growth goal is exempt under the California Environmental Quality Act and a categorical exemption will be prepared. In October 2019, Governor Newsom signed into law SB 330, which established a statewide, hou statewide housing emergency and implements the Housing Crisis Act of 2019. A key provision of this law prevents jurisdictions from limiting the number of housing permits or population within affected county areas. Affected county areas are defined as census designated places that lie wholly within census defined urbanized areas. In Santa Cruz County, this includes the following CDPs, Live Oak, Pasa Tiempo, Paradise Park, and Amesti, as shown in blue on this map. 
In accordance with the Housing Crisis Act of 2019, it is recommended that, the Santa, that Santa Cruz County not enforce the Measure J growth goal limit on residential allocations within these areas while this temporary statute is in place. And that will be from January 1st, 2020 to January 1st, 2025. Other aspects of Measure J unrelated to limiting building permit allocations will not be impacted by this bill and staff will continue to track Measure J allocations and sub subsequent building permit issuance in these areas for reporting purposes. As noted previously, in recent years, the number of building permits for new housing units has not come close to the county's growth goal. So it is not expected that the provision of SB 30, that this provision of SB 330 will impact the county's volume of permits for new housing. Staff therefore recommends that the board open the public hearing to consider the report on the year 2021 growth goal, refer this matter to the planning commission for consideration and recommendation to the board and continue the public hearing to establish the year 2021 growth goal to December 8th, 2020 with direction to planning staff to return with the recommendation of the planning commission and a re resolution for final action by the board. This concludes the staff presentation and I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Okay, are there any questions from board members? Uh, we can go to Advisor Leopold if you'd like. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I just had a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, this question about uh, SB 330. Um, since we've since it's been years since we've been anywhere close to um, the uh, allocation limit, mm -hmm. why would we not count? I mean, it, it's it seems. It seems odd not to include those in the count. Is that a legal requirement or is it just, uh, are we trying to get more permits? I'm, I, it, it, it seems odd to me. So we will still be counting and recording them in the presentation of the growth goal report. However, if we find that we're reaching that ceiling in these specific areas that we mentioned, the county will would not be according to SB 330 would not be allowed to enforce sure, the limit that, in that area, but we're still recording it in our data collection. Yeah, no, that's that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. The growth goal at 0.25% is lower than we've had in, in, in the past. Correct. Um, and, not, and that is because the population is going down rather than going up. Although most people in Santa Cruz don't ever feel like there's less people here. Um, is this the first time in the 40 plus years that we've doing it that we set it at, at 0.25%? Um, so the growth goal has been set at 0.5% for basically since around uh, the year 2000, around that era. Um, but it has been much higher in previous decades um, and going back to the 90s and especially in the 80s. Um, so I'm not actually sure about the exact number of times that it, if it was ever set at 0 0.25, but um, the goal is to make sure that we're accounting for our, our fair share. So we're trying to be commensurate with the state's growth goal, growth rate. Yeah, the, the, and that part makes sense. I just wanted to get yep. a clarity on that. The, the, the confusion I have is at 0.25%, it doesn't really seem like it really changes dramatically the number of building permits that we would make available. And I'm just trying to figure out exactly how that works to reduce it by half, but not see those allocations go down by half. Right, so part of it is the number of carryover permits that are about, um, you know, carried over from last year. And last year we set it at 0.5%. So there's a good amount of carryover allocations available. Um, I believe the total allocations from last year was in the four, 460s. I don't have the exact number in front Got of it. me right now. So it is a substantial decrease, but the carryover um, and the low number of allocations that we've given this year is, is probably why that lar large number, yeah, is there. Thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. okay. Appreciate it. Yeah. Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I do have one question possibly something that I had missed in the report. Um, I recognize that we have not used uh, these permits and that the carryovers cover it, but given the, the fires that occurred and given the number of unpermitted structures that were uh, lost, which is kind of an unknown exact number at this point, I just wanted to confirm that should those be rebuilt in 
2021 and come into compliance with permits that, that we would still have an adequate uh, number of permits to meet those rebuilds that are needed. Yeah, so that is something that our staff has been looking at. Um, obviously, we don't know exactly how many unpermitted, as you mentioned, we don't know how many unpermitted structures are out there. And we don't know exactly when people will be coming to the county to request building permits for, for re replacement units on those properties. Um, but the staff wants to assure the board that um, the growth goal will not be an obstacle for any property owners that might want to request an allocation in the next year. And um, one of our recommendations is that the board can decide to exempt the, uh, these permits from the county's, uh, the county's allocation system by resolution or ordinance, specifically for properties that were impacted by the CZU lightning complex um, fires. So um, that would be in accordance with Santa Cruz County Code section 12.02.02. <laughs> nine, um, which states that uh, such other building permits as may be determined consistent with chapters 7.01 and 7.04 of the SCCC can be um, to be exempt from the residential permit allocation system by resolution or ordinance of the board of supervisors. So it, we all we need to do is to demonstrate consistency with our county's growth management plan, which I think is self-evident since um, many of these properties will be essentially replacement units. We will not be increasing the population in this area, but rather maintaining the population. So um, that would be uh, our suggestion. Okay. Thank you, that's excellent. I appreciate that. Coonerty. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have to apologize. I didn't get a clear, um, uh, vocal um, reception on the uh, presentation, but I have read the report, and I really do want to thank the uh, the planning department for putting together a real succinct report about the work of our. Um, and it's really important that we track our goals relative to the outcomes we see here and here and look critically at the obstacles that stand in the way. Uh, um, I think people are shocked at how few permits we do issue every year. Uh, but a couple questions, and maybe you answered these, uh, or somebody did it in the process, but what role do our zoning regulations uh, continue to play in a low number of permits issued? Is it, our planning staff think uh, we are still too restrictive uh, I don't know if you can answer that or if the pl planning director would have to do that, but uh, just wanted to get a sense of um, if, uh, if we're this in our process overall. Um, yeah, I think I would refer you to the planning director on that. I know that, you know, as we've included in our report, there are just a number of different factors, including, you know, the status of the economy as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think the planning director would have a better answer for you on that. I, that's understand. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, the um, how does our missing these tar targets impact our arena obligations? And I say that as a member of uh, AMBAG, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. And next year, we're going to have to come up with our new projections. And the state and the governor are really pressing for us to uh, build more housing in this state. Um, and my understanding uh, from a review of a five county regional uh, uh, group that is looking at housing um, from Santa Cruz down to San Luis Obispo, the Santa Barbara County, it's updated arena numbers and uh, the state tripled the number that they're supposed to reach. Um, I don't know, I just, uh, it's certainly not the planning department's uh, uh, blame for this, but uh, I think we gotta get real about it what we can with the state or the state needs to get real about some of the limitations we face, uh, housing prices, whatever the case may be, uh, and not meeting our arena obligations. We don't get punished for it, but uh, I think we ought to get real with what's going on. And that, this uh, question is uh, really more, is directed more to the state, I guess, but how does um, our missing uh, th these, uh, these targets impact the arena obligations? 
Right, so um, I mean, the, the growth goal allocations are a very specific set of units that we're looking at. We're only looking at market rate units, so it does not count the affordable units, which are also required as part of our RENA obligation. Um, but we did include a brief summary of last year's housing element annual progress report on page 47 of your packet. Um, and right. according to that, uh, that summary there, um, right, so, you know, with, we're within the first six years of a nine year planning period um, for this RENA cycle. And the county has permitted a total of 503 units um, with still 811 units to remain. Um, so these are two sort of separate calculations for the numbers of units that we're permitting each year, but certainly um, it provides a small picture of at least the market rate units that we're trying to achieve. Right. I get it, and I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. It's just trying to get what the state wants and what can really happen uh, in a realistic world. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, I don't have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, my only comment or question would be, uh, uh, it's it's like a moving target trying to predict what the uh, population is. We're going to find out uh, probably in about six months or maybe a, a little longer uh, with the census taking place and everything. Mm -hmm. I think even the census will be a little bit off uh, because of the pandemic and also the fires and everything else that's happened. But. Uh, uh, my understanding is actually the population of Capitola, uh, when I was uh, talking to a couple of council members, uh, this was uh, over a year ago. They were saying that the population of Capitola was actually going down a little bit mm -hmm. rather than going up. Right. So in our um, population estimates shown in the earlier part of our report, I can get you the exact number, uh, page number if that's helpful. Um, on page uh, 33 of your packet, um, we do include Department of Finance demographic uh, research on population estimates that show that the city of Capitola did see a, a, a slight decrease in population in the, in the past two years. Okay. So yeah, you're right. Thanks, thank <laughs> you. And uh, we'll open it up to, uh, for the public hearing on the item number nine. And hello, Becky. Thank you, <clears throat> Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aptos. I, um, I want to clarify something that I heard it, and, and I heard you say that you recommend measure J is not uh, implemented in the three affected areas, Live Oak, Paradise Park and Amesti. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me and maybe um, Supervisor Leopold, that's what you were asking about. This is, to me, very confusing information that uh, we would not want to uh, uh, make sure that there would be 15% affordable inclusionary housing in those areas when there is when there are building permits issued. Um, I also note that that uh, in the report that. Uh, it is anticipated that AMBAG could possibly double our RENA numbers and Supervisor McPherson referred to that happening in Santa Barbara. That makes no sense to me either. If the California's population is decreasing, why would the RENA numbers increase by two and threefold? And I hope you can help us understand that. Um, I. I am also concerned, as was uh, Supervisor McPherson, about what happens if we don't meet our RENA numbers. We've seen that Governor Newsom sued the city of Huntington Beach for not meeting these numbers. So uh, how big is the stick? <laughs> and, and what uh, effects could it have on our community, especially if we're going to be telling a number of people in the CZU area that they cannot rebuild? Um, are they gonna have to be forced into the town? Is that the plan? And is that uh, part of it? I'm curious about the numbers that are reported in terms of building permits. And I think I heard you say that affordable units are not included in the RENA numbers. That 
and, and please help me understand that if that's not, if I didn't hear it right, because that would explain why the number of building permits do not reflect the number of uh, the 57 uh, units in the 100% affordable housing in Supervisor Leopold's district that was approved on Capitola Road and the 11 units in Habitat Humanity. And there are many others like that, that those numbers, if you add them in, would far exceed the numbers that you've reported here. If affordable housing is not included in the arena numbers, that makes no sense to me because it's, it's development, it's increase in pop population. Um, I also want to point out that uh, in the county growth goal, it points out and has for the last few years that infrastructure is the most limiting factor in growth, uh, namely water, but also roads. So how will we incorporate those needs into our growth goal? Thank you. you All right. Um, so first I want to clarify that the uh, RENA units are set by the state. They do inclu include affordable units. Um, they are separate from what we're talking about here, which is the growth goal. These are specifically uh, about market rate units. So the affordable units are included in our RENA obligation. Um, I also want to clarify that, um, as I mentioned, the only impacts of SB 30 on our Measure J growth goal will be um, we cannot limit the population and thus we cannot limit the building permits in those specific areas. The affordability requirements as the other aspects of Measure J are not gonna be impacted by SB 330. It's just the population and building permit limits. Okay. <clears throat> Do we have any uh, comments from? Thank you, Supervisor. We have one by Ken Davenport. The negative population growth reported by Kathleen Malloy's report is concerning. Why is Santa Cruz County so far below the state average? Why is Santa Cruz County performing below Monterey, Santa Clara, and San Mateo counties? I have the problem, is the problem your planning department and land use policies? What can you learn from more successful counties around you? Thank you. And that's the end of public comment. Thank you, Supervisor. <clears throat> I'll bring it, uh, bring it back to the board for either discussion or uh, motion. Uh, Chair, uh, I, I think uh, most people in Santa Cruz would uh, uh, like the idea of having limited growth and uh, are not alarmed by the decline in growth. But I think we should set these uh, growth goals and I would move the recommended actions. Okay. Second. We have a first and second. Second. Any, any other discussion? Uh, we'll call for a roll call vote. Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Chair Caput. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, that'll take us to item number 10 to consider a report of cannabis licensing of officials unappealable authority with regard to exception requests and options for appellate review of such decisions as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. Hello. Good morning, board. Um, Good morning. At the June 2nd board meeting, staff was directed to provide a report detailing areas within county code where the CLO has unappealable authority regarding licensing decisions. Staff was also asked to provide options for an appellate review of such decisions. With regard to non-retail cannabis operations, the CLO has limited authority to allow exceptions to setbacks in the Rodeo Gulch zoning overlay. This area was seen as the most appropriate area within the county for these types of operations and in an effort to streamline the use permit process, this area was selected to provide CLO discretion. The basis for this was um, there's one uh, non-conforming home in the area which was causing all use permit applications to be uh, level five in this area. As a refresher, this is the Rodeo Gulch zoning overlay where the CLO has the authority to approve setback exceptions for cultivation, distribution, and non-volatile manufacturing operations. 
With regard to retail cannabis operations, the CLO has limited authority to allow setback exceptions when they make a finding that the general public benefit outweighs concerns regarding intensity of use, land use compatibility, and public health and safety. Staff has developed three options for the board to consider moving forward. The three basic options include maintaining the current process, scheduling a public hearing prior to approval, or lastly, creating a public notice and appeal process for the general public after the CLO makes a decision. As we move forward and review these options, the board should consider that these options can be independently implemented for either non-retail or retail operations or both. Now, the second option noted in the board memo is to have a public hearing in front of the CLO. This process would effectively mimic a zoning administrator public hearing where the project would be reviewed, the public would be able to provide written and verbal input, and the CLO would make a decision. The public could then appeal that decision to an adjudicative body who would be responsible for hearing the appeal in a timely manner, and their decision would be final and only appealable to the superior court. The third option noted in the memo is allow the CLO to make a decision and provide the public an opportunity to initiate an appeal. The appeal of a CLO decision would be to an adjudicative body who would be responsible for the hearing or for hearing the appeal in a timely manner and their decision would be final and appealable only to the superior court. As you consider these three options, you must also consider who the adjudicative body will be. No matter who the adjudicative body is, the process allows the public to have a complete understanding of the CLO's technocratic decision. As the CLO will be tasked with explaining their decision to the public, options for an adjudicative body include an administrative hearing officer who is an independent lawyer and effectively acts as a judge, um, an assistant CAO, could be the decision maker as they have a unique perspective on the county. And lastly, yourselves as the board collectively are an option because you represent the voters. Now, moving forward, um, staff has presented the three basic options for you to consider for either the non-retail process or the retail process or both. Please let me know if I can answer any questions about these options. Okay, uh, we'll open it up to questions. Uh, hopefully uh, this item doesn't take up uh, too much time uh, considering the agenda that we do have. Uh, anyway, I'm leaning towards leaving things the way that they are right now, but anyway. Uh, will any other uh, questions or comments by board members? Yeah, and Chair, this is the Supervisor Friend. I, I had actually requested that this item uh, be, can be folded into the previous update. And I appreciate the CLO and County Council and others coming back with a process. Uh, this, I think there was an unintended consequence of us not having any sort of review or public process on this exemption process. We don't have this, by the way, really anywhere else that I can think of in the code where you would have a unilateral authority uh, without any public input or appeal capability. Uh, so, in my district, uh, which helped bring this up, there is a, a retail location that uh, has received a lot of pushback from an affordable housing development next door as well as some of the surrounding businesses, but there hasn't been any possibility for input into the appropriateness of the findings of, of these exemptions. So I'm supportive of creating an appellate process uh, and this is no statement actually, uh, or a lack of confidence at all in the CLO's decision that the CLO was granted this exact authority by the board. And I think though that uh, now seeing what it looks like in action, I think that that uh, the board should uh, just modify this. For me, I think that uh, option number three, which creates uh, the ability after a decision has been made by the CLO, uh, would make the most sense. That's pretty common in how we do things anyway on an appellate component. I think it should be an administrative hearing officer and, and not a, and a county employee. I think that the administrative officer should hear the information de novo and actually have the capability of specifically making a determination on that. I also believe, though, that that as part of this, that the county supervisor whose district 
this decision is being considered should be notified in advance of a decision uh, by the CLO. Uh, there isn't a current requirement on that, and unfortunately, um, considering the what could be considered a, a large decision made in this capability, we are notified of everything from vacation rentals to even when when construction equipment is going to be cited in our district. But there's no process now to currently notifying the board. I have no issue with the current Rodeo Gulch overlay. I think that this should be specific to retail. So I, I would be supportive of that. Obviously, I want to hear what my colleagues have to say, but when it becomes time for a motion, what I, what I would be supporting is, is option three with a little bit of the additional clarity that uh, the board item had requested from the board as to how we see that structure. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and option three is the CLO approves the setback exception use uh, and administrative hearing officer and assistant county administrative officer, the board of supervisor, or whichever individual body the board prefers to use uh, as the body to hear appeals to implement this option. Okay. Go ahead, well, any other uh, comments, uh, Supervisor uh, Coonerty? I have no comments at this time. I look forward to public comment. Okay. And Supervisor McPherson? Yeah, I uh, would be supportive of uh, what was stated by uh, Supervisor Friend. Uh, I, I don't, I wasn't, uh, the vocal is on and off for me, but I'm not sure. Uh, I think we should use an administrative hearing officer. Um, that's that's my only point uh, that I, I think ought to be specified. Yes. Um, so uh, as we've gone through this process of uh, figuring out how to license uh, both uh, retail and non-retail cannabis, uh, my memory of we got to this place of having the CLO uh, be the sole person because the board in a lot of ways was tired of, of spending hours on cannabis related items. Um, the idea of having uh, some other uh, appeal process is not necessarily a bad one. But one of the things that we have experienced uh, in the past is that there have been um, members of the county staff who don't want to get involved in this activity. Now that's um, in, the, in the past, uh, some members of the planning department haven't wanted to get involved. And you know, things have changed in terms of the, the, the legal nature of, um, of cannabis. And now we see that as a, as a county business and they contribute to our bottom line in terms of taxes. But I just wanna make sure that the administrative he hearing officer doesn't carry any biases or reluctance uh, because mainly these are land use choices. Um, this is a highly regulated uh, retail business. Uh, I'm not sure that there's any retail business that is as highly regulated in terms of what you can do on, on the premises, what, um, uh, uh, what kind of security you have to have maybe gun shops, maybe um, uh, bars to a certain extent. And so we're talking about a very highly regulated business and sometimes it needs an exception because we have very narrow um, um, economic districts. And so just making sure that if we have a process that's appealable, that someone takes that into consideration, it would be useful um, in any process that we create. Okay. Uh, we'll open up uh, for, well, uh, this is, uh, this would, uh, this is brought up uh, because of district two, I guess, something coming up, but uh, if we decide this one way or the other, it has ramifications through the whole county, right? Uh, yes, it would. And um, per supervisor friends, um, for what he discussed, he's thinking only to consider this for the, the retail operations. And my understanding is uh, Supervisor McPherson was was also in, in favor of that. Um, I th think, you know, staff is really seeking direction from the board on this item. Our main concern with the adjudicative bodies is uh, we're placing all of the uh, power potentially in either an assistant CAO, um, an administrative hearing officer or the board itself. If we go with either the first two options, it's a single individual who uh, may or may not uh, completely understand 
the county re regulations and requirements associated with these businesses. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that staff was clear to the board and, and the members of the public that our main concern with uh, choosing the first two options is all the power rests within that one individual who um, we don't know if there is, uh, we don't know how well they understand the code and how well they understand the state requirements and, and things of that nature. So we just want to clarify that. Okay. okay. I'll open it up to public comment. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I live in rural Aptos. Um, thank you for the, the presentation. What I want to know is how much the appeals would cost, because if it comes before the Board of Supervisors, it costs the people $1,800. That's prohibitive to a lot of people. So what would an appeal process cost? That needs to be very clear. I, um, I would actually favor an ad administrative hearing officer. The county already contracts with such a person for the assessment appeals board. This person, um, I don't know who it is now, it used to be Mr. McSpadden. I, I went to some of those appeal hearings and they were very fair, they were very good and uh, very well run. And I think that if you've got um, a certain level of mistrust uh, regarding county government, having a completely independent uh, legal person there would instill a better level of confidence in the appeal process for all sides, perhaps. So I would favor that as well. And I would um, ask that the board consider using what we've already got on board with our assessment appeals um, ad adjudicative officer and uh, just expand that. That person was very knowledgeable about county land use policies and would be a, a good choice and already under county payroll. Thank you. Okay. How's it going? Um, my name is Kirk Nelson. I'm a local contractor who deals with both cannabis and non-cannabis clients. And uh, to be honest, I <clears throat> am absolutely 100% for the appeals process, if not at least, if not also including the ability to bring it to public notice. Because as you mentioned, if a gun shop, liquor store, or bar were to open in an area, they would have to announce it publicly to the general public and allow them to input whether or not that would potentially be allowed to ha happen especially if the offset is zero feet, um, which there is a proposed construction site which has a zero foot offset to a low income housing or affordable housing unit. Um, so with that, there should be at least the ability to appeal, if not ask for public input to whether or not there is truly a greater good for that, in this case, a retail dispensary to be brought into that neighborhood. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll bring it back to the, uh, we have any other well, comments? Okay. I just, uh, I'll just like to clarify, some of the businesses discussed wouldn't necessarily have a public notification if they're principally permitted use. Is that correct? Well, what we're envisioning is that we would go and, and, and create some draft ordinance amendments uh, to come back to you regarding chapter seven. And it would only relate to those instances where the CLO was about to use uh, their, um, formerly unappealable authority to, uh, to go to make a decision different from what the setbacks normally are. But, uh, but uh, in the question of the gun shop or the bar, they don't necessarily have notification. We don't always do notification on those. On a gun shop or a bar? Yeah. Yeah, I just, I would, I would have to look further into that. I'm not aware off the top of my head if that's Yeah, I mean, they the were case. just a couple of years ago, principally permitted uses. Uh, I know we changed the rules on gun shops that they have a much more involved, that, but it has to go through um, the sheriff's office. And, you know, we don't actually have any gun shops in the county uh, at, at the moment, but they, they have to go through a much uh, rigorous uh, level of review uh, before they're allowed to open. But I'm not sure it necessarily requires public notification. You know, I think that that um, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with the way things are. I understand that my colleagues are interested in, in having some kind of appeal process. Um, I would be willing to support that. 
uh, I think that I just want to make sure that it's someone who actually understands the rules because we now have, I don't know, 10 years of, of, of dispensary operation here in Santa Cruz County in the unincorporated area. Um, we, you could look at the information. These are generally not problem locations um, that, that because of their security and other requirements um, and people just coming and going, it's, it's, they're, they're not problem locations, um, but there is a fear uh, because it involves something that used to be illegal. And I understand that as well. So having some kind of appeal process is uh, I could support. I'm not sure it's necessary, but I understand the need. Okay, uh, on the option, uh, option three would make it more difficult to get an exception to let's say a setback or whatever from like a school or from somebody's property or whatever. Uh, it would not make the process more difficult. Um, option three would allow the CLO to review the application, um, make a determination and if, it's, if it were an approval determination, um, the findings that are required by code would be made. The public would be notified of those filing or of those findings uh, via mail. The applicant would have to mail out to everyone within 600 feet, um, similar to what's done with a level five process for a zoning administrator hearing. So the public notification would go out. The, including the findings, the public would be given 14 days to file an appeal. If an appeal were, were to be filed, um, it would go to an adjudicated body. So it, it doesn't change the process, the internal process within the building. It just allows the public uh, the ability to file an appeal based on the technical decision made by the canvas licensing official. Okay, option, option one, if it stays the same. Yeah. And what, what's the process? Uh, let's say uh, you give a, uh, you, you grant the exception. Yes. Uh, the public doesn't have to be uh, notified uh, that you've made a decision or does the public have input or they don't? Uh, the public is not notified of the decision and there's no uh, public input made. It's simply a technical decision. Okay, so I'm, 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 I, I'm gonna go, I, I'm leaning towards option three, uh, like uh, Zach Friend said. Okay. All right, so that's uh, yeah, any, uh -huh. I'll move the recommended actions with the direction that we uh, follow option three um, and that the specific adjudicative body be an administrative hearing officer uh, this includes the the uh, written notice, uh, the proof of mailing, the, the uh, deadline for 14 days, and that an appeal time be set. Uh, additionally, I'd like to ask uh, for additional, oh, that, that they be able to consider the information uh, de novo, the, uh, uh, the administrative hearing officer, and additionally, that the county supervisor of the district where the exception is being considered be notified of the application in advance of the CLO's determination. Okay, we, we have a motion and do we have a second? I'll second. I'll, I'll second it. It sounds like Supervisor Coonerty second. Uh, oh, Su Supervisor Coonerty <laughs> said yes. Uh, Chair, okay. Chair Caput, um, may staff request clarification from Supervisor Friend on the motion. Is this only to apply to the retail process? I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Laporte. Yes, for the retail operations. Thank you. Is that accepted by uh, the seconder? What's the current seconder? rule on the cultivation right now? Uh, the, the current rule on cultivation, um, Chair Caput, is the... CLO only has authority within that rodeo gulch zoning overlay to approve a setback exception. And that's based on that, uh, the previous issues we'd run into with a non-conforming home in that area, changing all of the use permits to level five. So it's the CLO's authority with regard to cultivation is limited to the rodeo gulch zoning overlay only. 
So if only in one district, it's, it's my district. All We've right. talked about it. Yeah. It seems entirely appropriate. Okay. Okay. Uh, we, we, we have a motion and we have a second. So we'll call the roll. Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Chairman Caput. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. And that so takes us to- Chair Caput, I think we're we'll gonna break for break, closed break, session right. and then return at 1.30 for item number 11. Can, okay. can we break for lunch? I mean, it's, it's, it's not realistic to think that we're gonna go the rest of this time without eating. Yes, no, we can break for lunch. Should we return at um, 1.45 or two? That would be great. Okay. Uh, I think at 145. Is that 145? Enough time? Yeah, 145. Fine. Okay. Okay. We'll return at 145 with the uh, uh, public defenders uh, number 11. Are are we going into uh, closed session? We are. Yes, we do have a closed session right now. Okay. I, then, right. we, then we can come back at. I'm I'm sorry. I we should have, have said that. So we should come back at two o'clock. Let's return it to, we'll do closed session right now. We have some folks waiting. Okay, so we're, we're gonna have closed session right now. Is that yes. correct? And then, uh, then we'll return it at two o'clock. That's right, and there's nothing reportable from closed session. Okay, okay. And we'll return it at two o'clock for the public defenders. Uh, number item number 11, consider assessment of indigent uh, defense services in Santa Cruz County, consider approval and concept of ordinance adding chapter 2.13 to the Santa Cruz County code to establish a public defender's office and the position of public defender Schedule the ordinance for second reading and final adoption on October 20, 2020. Direct the county administrative office to transition services and return in March of 2021 with an update and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. So we'll start with uh, the right to counsel evaluation of trial level indigent representation services and ordinance adding chapter 2.13. Oh, good, good, good afternoon, best. Chair Caput um, and members of the board. So I'm Nicole mm -hmm. Coburn, Acting County Administrative Officer. I'm joined today by Principal Administrative Analyst Sven Stafford, who's been working with me on the public defender transition and he's going to be helping deliver a portion of today's presentation. So this is our agenda for the presentation. Uh, first, we'd like to cover the transition timeline and give an overview of key findings from the assessment of current indigent defense services. We're going to follow that with the proposed framework for the future of indigent services. And then lastly, we'll summarize the recommendations and next steps. Um, I'd also like to note that the six amendment con center consultants who worked with us on the assessment are joining virtually today by teams and are available for questions after the presentation if you have any. Before we get started, we'd like to acknowledge Mr. Larry Bingham and Mr. Jerry Christensen with Bingham, Christensen and Minsloff for more than 40 years of service to the county. And I, I should note it's actually 45. Their contribution to justice and dedication to the residents of the county cannot be overstated. Their work and the work of the conflict firms has made the county a better place to live. We look forward to their expertise and collaboration as the county transitions to a nurse, new service model. And we'd also like to thank the conflict firms, specifically Mr. Mitchell Page with Page and Dudley, Mr. Tom Walraff with Walraff and Associates, as well as Ms. Tamara Rice with County Council who administers the Criminal Defense Conflicts Program. All of them um, spent a lot of time working with us and the consultant on the assessment, and we thank them for all their collaboration. 
So just as a reminder of where we've been and where we're heading, um, a, a possible public tra tra defender transition has been under discussion th since 2016. In 2018, the board approved amendments to the current public defender contracts, and these contracts memorialized the, these discussions on the transition. This included a three-year transition beginning in fiscal year 1920 and ending in 21-22. In the contract renewal, the county also committed to prioritize staff employed with Bigham, Christensen, and Minsloff um, and provide them with the right of first opportunity to work for the county as part of a transition. A transition process was subsequently approved by the board in 2019 when the Sixth Amendment Center was hired to conduct an independent and objective assessment of current services. Over a nine month period, the assessment included a, a review of federal and state law, analysis of case data, two site visits, 50 hours and 50 interviews with law firm and panel attorneys, 12 hours and 17 interviews with superior court judges, 13 hours spent um, meeting with probation district attorney and county administrative office staff, and 15 hours of court observations. Today, we're bringing options and a recommendation for the board to consider as the next steps as we with the goal of transitioning uh, services by July 1st of 2022. So now I'm going to turn it over to Sven, who's going to address the assessment. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, good afternoon, supervisors. Um, so to move forward, we have to understand the current system, uh, where it performs well and where we can make it better. Uh, as Nicole mentioned, uh, we worked with the Sixth Amendment Center uh, to conduct a nine month review of, uh, of indigent services. Uh, and on that team was a group of uh, six indigent defense experts, including uh, the 28 year director of the King County Defender Association uh, up in Seattle and uh, a steering committee member of the National Association for Public Defense. So the key findings of the, of the assessment really reveal the root deficiencies in the flat fee contracts that were issued by the county. Uh, this type of contract isn't best practice and did lead to both some theoretical and some actual uh, findings in the indigent defense system. Um, the assessment really does uh, reveal an opportunity to make our indigent defense services better, um, particularly in terms of uh, being able to establish uh, local caseload standards. Um, uh, the assessment uses national caseload standards to uh, draw its comparisons, but it really uh, highlights the, the need for us as a local community to establish those standards for ourselves um, and, and revealed some need for more investment in uh, technology and training. So I'm gonna spend the, the most, most of my time today talking about the framework for future indigent defense services. Um, so guided by the findings of the Sixth Amendment Center uh, assessment, um, our, uh, the CAO does recommend transitioning to a new public defender's office. And in this section, we'll talk about uh, the framework for the new public defender's office, again, guided that by those recommendations. So what we're building, and then we'll present a, a transition plan. Um, so, you know, defining how, how we exactly intend to get to that new office. So the county recommends a hybrid public private system that builds on the strengths of the current system and allows flexibility for the county to build its indigent defense system over the next several years. Uh, as you'll see in this uh, slide here, uh, there are two proposed uh, divisions, a public defender division, which would be a traditional internal department comprised of uh, county employed attorneys, uh, and then a conflicts division that would be modeled on the current uh, fourth party conflict panel program, which would be overseen by county staff, but staffed by private bar attorneys retained on a case by case basis. Uh, the public defender division would have 
primary representation duties for felonies, misdemeanors, and delinquencies, and the conflicts division would provide conflict representation for those same cases, and also primary representation under uh, for a number of different case types. Uh, the advantages of this system are that it locates transparency and accountability in one office. Uh, it provides for flexible staffing justified by uh, local caseload standards. Uh, it creates uh, attorney salary parity with county council and the DA, and also creates transparency within that uh, uh, staffing system. Uh, it centralizes investment and technology and training, and it provides for collaboration with other county departments, including health services, human services, and the probation department when appropriate. We did consider alternatives and alternatives are available um, for the board to consider. Um, one option would be to remain a contract model county. Uh, we could issue a new request for, request for proposals with outcome-based incentives um, and, and structure the contract in, in a way that's uh, that alleviates uh, potentially some of the, the concerns raised in the uh, Sixth Amendment Center assessment. The advantages of this would be that it could potentially provide for more efficient services and it would avoid certain one-time costs of creating a county department. Um, the disadvantages would be that there would be, again, less transparency and accountability and that the uh, contracts would again be diffuse um, and not centralized in one place and um, an open RFP potentially creates additional uh, uncertainty with uh, depending on which firms would be able to respond to it. Uh, the, second, the second model would be to adopt an all private bar model. Uh, this is currently practiced in San Mateo County near us. Uh, the San Mateo advantage is that that system has grown organically over a number of years. Um, it does create a smaller administrative footprint and again avoids those one-time costs. The disadvantages include, uh, again, less transparency and accountability and potentially um, you know, more staffing turnover and, and uh, the inability to uh, create institutional knowledge. So uh, how do we get there? Um, there are basically two, uh, two tracks. First is creating the foundation. So what can we do short term in the next year and a half uh, for the department to start? And then uh, the medium term. So what can we do building on that foundation uh, in the first two to five years? So the current indigent defense budget uh, is approximately $13 million. And we believe that within that same envelope, we can provide uh, uh, similar staffing infrastructure and enhance county collaboration and partnerships. In terms of staffing, uh, the indigent defense system currently handles around 11,000 cases per year. Um, across our entire system. At any one time, we have about between 33 and 35 full-time employees uh, within between the main, con main law firm, the conflict firms, and the fourth party panel. Uh, we believe that within our budget envelope, we can provide between 15 to 20% more attorneys. We believe that we can uh, provide dedicated social work staff and, uh, and IT and administrative support. In terms of infrastructure, uh, no matter what, what system the, the board ends up recommending, um, a new case management system is going to be required. Uh, it'll be required to establish the local standards and local data that we wanna use. Um, and we are currently working with the, the district attorney on an RFP that we hope will come, uh, come to the board shortly. Um, this will uh, you know, um, make it possible to have the, have the data to make certain actionable decisions. Um, and 
working with the DA will provide for uh, better data sharing and, and silos obviously where appropriate. Uh, in terms of training, we wanna uh, maintain the good work that is done uh, in terms of training locally. Uh, we'll also have the opportunity to apply for new state resources uh, as, the, as money has been included in the state budget for uh, indigent defense training. And we'll be monitoring that, uh, monitoring the state for grant opportunities. Um, and we'll need to uh, bolster juvenile attorney training as well. In terms of collaboration and partnerships, the new public defender's office will benefit from uh, integration into the social and safety net services. Um, so in social workers and, and collaborating with the human services department to connect uh, clients to benefits, um, stronger partnerships with health services, especially for uh, mental health court and substance use services, um, better integration for clients with probation services where appropriate, uh, especially you know, employment and education services um, and, um, and working with community organizations and advocates. Um, and we, we do intend to have uh, an advisory group um, in some form that we'll bring to the board uh, later of, of criminal justice partners that would be able to guide the new department. So in terms of building a stronger system over the medium term, so two to five years, um, we believe that building on that foundation will provide for uh, provide for transparency um, through our budget and finance process, through systems that we've set up currently with our strategic and operational plans, uh, through other initiatives supporting those plans, such as performance measurement and process improvement. Um, we believe that it'll increase uh, accountability, uh, that we'll be able to develop local caseload standards that'll produce timely, accurate, and relevant reports. Um, It'll also be able to adapt to um, our local court practices and changes in state law. And finally, on equity, um, we do really wanna be centering equity in decision-making. Um, the, the new department will benefit from work that we've done um, with uh, the core community programs, with the uh, Task Force for Justice and Gender, and gender uh, with the community corrections partnership and also with our uh, the district attorney's new initiative on neighborhood courts as well. Um, we wanna continue expanding our work in South County and then we'll, we fully intend to create a client-centered office that is uh, culturally responsive and, and also trauma-informed. And with that, I'll give it back to Nicole. So today we're asking the board to approve the recommended action shown here. The first of which would be to accept and file the assessment of current indigent services. Um, the second to approve and concept the ordinance establishing a public defender office and the position of public defender with final adoption on October 20th. This is really the first step of many in moving forward with the transition. Um, we acknowledge that there's still a lot of work to do. Um, following this item, there are many actions that must be taken and brought back to the board to even start to establish and recruit an independent county public defender. Um, this is an important step in the process so that that person can get to know key stakeholders and work on the large amount of administrative policy and many other logistics of establishing a new department. Um, we also asking the board to direct the CAO tra to transition indigent defense services by July 1st of 2022, um, that to ensure a smooth transition and continuity of operations with our criminal justice partners. This is gonna require significant cooperation and guidance from the current indigent defense law firms and the superior court. The CAO is committed to working with these partners throughout the transition and we're prepared to define the roles and responsibilities of the transition planning team, which would include these partners and immediately establish a regular meeting schedule. What's proposed today is a big change. We recognize that that's gonna require a lot of hard work and collaboration. We currently have um, less than 21 months to complete the transition. 
So we must keep moving forward and making progress if the transition is to be successful. We would return to the board in March of 2021 with an update on these efforts. And lastly, I wanna note, while the current system has worked well, we are really focused on how we can do even better and achieve a more transparent, accountable and equitable indigent defense system. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions that the board might have. Okay. Uh, I have a few things to say, but I'll, I'll let, uh, let's, uh, we can start with uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to wait until I hear public comment before, uh, before asking any questions. Uh, Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I do have a, a brief question, which is just in regards to, uh, well, actually there were two questions. One of them dealt with the Sixth Amendment Center's staffing recommendations, which are based on, on uh, national standards. My understanding is that very few, if any, communities have, have met those standards. And so there was, uh, in the report, it had noted that there would be a local analysis that's being completed. But did you have a sense then of where where we are versus where we would need to be and, and what a realistic timeline in that transition would be in order to meet that increased staffing uh, for the local analysis. Do you have sort of any pre-information on, on the staffing component? Well, Supervisor Friend, so I think we're hoping as part of getting a case management system and being able to look at the data and establish local measures and standards to do that work over the next couple of years. Uh, what we're proposing is to come back with um, a, a bait, you know, what we believe we can achieve within the current budget of the public defender and really work on that, that over the next couple of years to, to get a better look and handle on what's happening um, to see what else, you know, we might need to do in terms of, you know, augmenting or adjusting staff. Okay, and I would feel more comfortable. I mean, I, I saw that we did receive a letter from the current public defender as well as the presiding judge and others on, on the bench. Um, I mean, I've had nothing but personal uh, positive interactions both in my current job and previously when I worked at the police department with the current public defender's office and their staff. Um, I, I think that there needs to be a role for that current staff within the new agency. I recognize um, when you become public employees, generally there's a probation process, et cetera. But has there been talk specifically about how those employees would transition over to a new public department? Um, I need to be part of the transition plan. Um, we, we did say that those specific steps that would be taken to offer employment and um, make that available to the firm staff would be known. Um, and Ajita Patel is here who can address those sorts of questions. But I believe that we still need to work out all the details on how that would take place. But we do have, uh, we did offer the first right of opportunity to the Bigham employees in terms of becoming county employees. Uh, good afternoon, Ajita Patel, personnel director. I just wanted to echo that what Nicole shared, supervisor friend, is accurate. And while those details haven't have not been worked out, we do have an opportunity through the transition to work out those details about probationary period and how people would transition over and what that process would look like. So certainly we've got an opportunity to work on that and also work with the stakeholders in establishing that process. Thank you, Ms. Patel. Maybe then as a follow to you before you leave there. I mean, my concern, and I imagine that this is the county's concern as well, is I don't want to create, I don't want the board to take an action today and therefore next two weeks from now or whatever it is, uh, with, with a level of uncertainty that would create an issue for sort of like a purgatory time in advance of April of next year when we would have a new PD in place. I mean, if the intention is to transition these employees over, I think there needs to be a pretty direct statement that's made and, and the details associated with that. I think the sooner 
that we had those, the better, because the, if the board is moving forward with the transition, the board would want to know how the staff is transitioning as well, because a large part of this is an assumption that we can provide an additional staffing and staff support model, but that would be predicated on that we would have a basis of these existing staff. I mean, the staff isn't obviously going to manifest. So that detail, I think, is actually a pretty important thing for the board to have knowledge of before the, the board uh, transitioned the model. And, and so how would, how would we have that assurance is, I guess, my question. So it is my understanding with the discussions with the CAO's office that today any action you take certainly does not preclude us or prevent us from establishing that transition for existing employees. Today is really just the framework. My thoughts on this would be that I would sit at the table, be part of that transition team, and we would do what we have at other times which is that we would really have an opportunity for the existing employees to turn in a resume and show us their interest. And then by at that same time, we also need to create a process where those employees can examine their interest to be a part of our county structure. There's questions about salaries and benefits. And at this juncture, we have not, um, laid the complete foundation of, on that, but we would certainly, it would seem to me that what we need to have established before we do anything to give your board a plan for what does that look like and what our screening tool would be. Of course, the main per, uh, screening tool, of course, is that they're all lawyers and I know they all are today and have an opportunity for them to examine their interests with us and then also look at their background and experience, which I am very confident that many of those attorneys will meet all of our education experience standards. So I think it's really a matter of us connecting with them and allowing them to ensure that they wanna be a part of this organization too. And while we don't have those solid plans today, I'm quite clear and so is the CAO's office that we would want to work those details of a process out with your board. And as I have often come when we're doing some new things, I'll be coming to closed session to have uh, detailed conversations with you all about that process. Okay, I, I completely respect the fact that, that there may be some employees who don't wanna come over um, uh, my concern would be that we would take a certain amount of time inserting in uncertainty to a situation that would mean some employees would seek employment, employment elsewhere. And since we're recognizing in part of this transition an understaffed component of the current private contract, I think by definition the degree by which we can preserve as much of the current staff is essential for us to have a successful public model. So therefore the timing I think is essential when the board is moving forward today. I mean, look, I support this movement to a public model. I assume that my colleagues overall do as well. I think that at a 30,000 foot view, we should recognize this is happening. The transition is, are the details here that I think are important because it's, it's difficult to take a broad action without actually knowing some of these details. So some of these assurances really do matter uh, to me, both on the staff side as well as knowing who would be at the table as part of the transition. And so that's where my concerns are. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Office of Bigham, Christensen, and Mislaw for the the services they've provided for so many years, what, 45, not 40, um, and through the conflict terms to handle other cases, uh, some of which have been very high for, uh, profile cases and done very well. Um, the report discusses a transition period between the end of the private contract and the opening of the public office, which includes hiring uh, the public defender and uh, support staff. How do we envision funding that while still addressing our obligations to the current contract? Supervisor McPherson, so our current contract goes through June 30th of 2022. As part of the process, you know, between now and then we'll be classifying and establishing all the positions. We need to work out exactly who is transitioning over when, assuming that 
all the employees from the existing firm are going to be taking jobs with the county. Hopefully we could establish something relatively smooth where where it's um, they're coming over to the a county, you know, right around that transition day. Obviously we need to bring over those cases and those people so that there isn't any sort of um, interruption of service. So that that is something that we're gonna be working out with the firms um, as part of this. Okay. Um, and, you, and I know we're all concerned, this has been addressed uh, partially about the budget cuts in future years to address the revenue losses we're experiencing, we're experiencing with COVID-19 and uh, the, pen, uh, the fires. Uh, how do we anticipate the office might do its part, so to speak, in shoulder in the future cuts across the county departments? Um, I mean, it might, it might even have changed since you've been talking about this for several months now and what you, you foresaw, what could be done, but under the current financial situation that we're in and going to be in for the next couple of years, um, how do you, are you just gonna just uh, take that into account, I'm sure, but how do you uh, see that this new uh, office shouldering at the future cuts across county departments? I mean, it would just be part of the overall plan, I guess? Right, so I think, you know, if there are future cuts to county departments, obviously, you know, we'll have to look at what, how that might impact the public defender. We are looking to augment the budget with um, other resources. Um, we're intending to apply for the BSCC grant funding that will, is available in the current state budget. Um, and we'll be looking towards um, other sources, you know, both state and federal grants. Um, we can take a look at how other public defender budgets are structured and potentially what um, they're bringing to, you know, offset the cost of their operations. But, you know, we fully intend to get creative and think outside the box and figure out ways that we can bring in more resources to offset any sort of reductions that might have to occur. Understood. Okay, thank you, Chair. I might have more questions later after public testimony. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> Supervisor Leopold. Thank you. Thank you for the report. Thank you for the report. Um, I appreciate this. You know, the, uh, as someone who's been very concerned about the state of our criminal justice uh, efforts here in Santa Cruz, been actively involved with many of these issues as we've gone through prison realignment and many other changes at the state level. Um, uh, the, this transfer of the format of how we do our public defense is very important to me and I think to the community. Our, our criminal justice system works best when, when all uh, elements are working well. And so this report gives us a chance to take a look at the public uh, defense system. We, you know, earlier today, we looked at um, a report about uh, those people being held in jail and, and uh, um, you know, the pretrial program, the recommendations. There's things I'd like the judiciary to be, to, to, to be better at. Uh, we've talked uh, in the past about the district attorney's office. I'm glad to see them moving forward with neighborhood courts. There's things that I'd like, uh, there's things that are just referenced in this report that I think we just need to talk about. Um, from the from just at the highest level, this um, report uh, seeks to identify a standard in which we are not making here in Santa Cruz County. They make the case that uh, that the caseloads are too great, and that we need to increase the number of lawyers who are helping meet the needs of our public defense system. However, the proposal. Um, at least using the existing funds that we have would increase the number, but it wouldn't meet the standard. So I guess the question is either uh, for our staff or the Sixth Amendment Center is which California counties are, are meeting that standard? I would probably defer that to Sixth Amendment Center to, to address you know, who, which other jurisdictions either in California or elsewhere. David Carroll or John Mosier, who's on the Teams meeting. David, I don't know if you could talk about that. Sure, um, good afternoon and uh, thank you for the opportunity. And on behalf of the Sixth Amendment Center, I just wanna say, um, you know, we're, we're sorry for all that you have been going through with the wildfires and the pandemic, and we hope to be able to help you 
um, in this transition. Um, the issue of workload is one that isn't well documented in California. Um, there's certainly some places that have very um, stringent um, caseloads, um, places like San Francisco and others that use um, even more uh, flat fee contracts that have people handle excessive caseloads for a single flat fee. Um, and so um, the, the national standards that we cite in the report are ones that are met in several jurisdictions across the country. They're not aspirational by any stretch of the imagination. Um, my home state of Massachusetts actually has uh, far lower caseload thresholds um, than what's um, propo proposed in the national standards. But I think the point here is that uh, Santa Cruz doesn't know exactly how many cases are being handled and to what degree of difficulty. Um, we mentioned in this um, study that uh, the use of uh, quarterbacks to handle a bunch of cases early on mean that the cases of most of the trial attorneys are much more difficult and harder, and the national standards don't really apply in those situations, but even then, you're far in excess of them. What we've proposed, and really if it wasn't for the pandemic and the wildfires, we probably would have had a more specific transition plan. But what we're saying is through a new case tracking system, you need to have the information about what the criminal justice system caseload will look like on the backside of all of this. There's a great chance that um, you know, through efforts and other things, there will be less cases brought in the criminal justice system, which means you would not have to need as many attorneys as you do. Um, there may be, you know, a need for even more cases if people are out of work and, and crime increases, let's hope not. Um, and so the, in, the, the main thrust here is that you don't have the information currently. There's not enough transparency in your system to accurately project what the workload should or should not be specifically for Santa Cruz. And that's why we're, we're proposing this sort of transition period to start getting the data to know exactly how many attorneys you will need. Um, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, you mentioned Massachusetts as a place where they maybe have lower uh, uh, caseloads, but are there many other counties in the country that meet these national standards? That there information's are, I mean, in the there's, report. There's no, yeah, there's no doubt that uh, indigent defense is a crisis in, a, in large swatches of, of the United States. You can look at situations in Missouri and elsewhere, but there are a number of places, um, you know, usually in urban centers that have very stringent caseload standards. Um, uh, the, the workload standards in, in uh, Seattle and throughout Washington, for instance, um, are very good. Um, and so um, places like DC and New York and others, um, there's places that really do meet these standards and, accept, and in fact uh, go quite below them because they think the national standards are way too high as well. Uh, so I appreciate that all the examples you gave were big cities and not counties. That that would be interesting for me to know about uh, about what counties are actually meeting that standard. You know, the other the, the uh, report also talks about the case management system, and I know there's a need for case management because the Justice Reinvestment Initiative, which happened what seven eight years ago, identified data as a big problem. Um, it, it, I was surprised during that process. Uh, that uh, we, it was hard to get even data about who was in our jail. It's, it's take, taken us several years to do a better job of just collecting who's actually in custody, uh, let alone how that process works. In that process, um, the, uh, the consultant at that time identified that court processing plays a big role. The, the role, the, uh, how soon it can get on the calendar, is there a continuance asked? You know, who asked for the continuances? We have no way of actually knowing that because so much of this work is done on paper in all parts of the system. So case management uh, seems to be uh, to be important, whatever system we go with. Um, but I don't know much ab about this. Uh, obviously, we haven't invested in it be before. Do we have an idea? Do we get an off-the-shelf 
uh, case management system? Do you have any idea what the costs are there? I mean, or a range of the costs there? Uh, Supervisor Leopold, there are a few systems that the DA has explored already. Um, there is a, a group that's been working on trying to scope out as part of working towards an RFP you know, what might be available. Um, I know that we had a recent conversation with another county, I believe it was King County. Uh, they just uh, implemented a new, a new public defender case management system. So we were able to learn a few things from, from the person who led that effort. Um, but in terms of which product we might get, you know, there are some that are existing already that might be customizable based on our needs. Um, I'm not sure we're looking at generating something entirely from scratch. I think we're looking to a company that has a proven track record that we can um, bring into our county. And then in terms of the cost, we're still exploring, you know, what that might be. Um, but, you know, it, it, it could be a significant investment, but it would be, you know, a one-time um, infusion into both our district attorney and public defense systems um, that would have a long-term benefit. Yeah, the, it, the investments make difference, uh, but we're, we're trying to figure out also what the costs are here. That's right. what I'm trying to get to. Uh, you bring up the DA, and I, there's a part of this report that I just wanted to r reference. I don't see them represented here today. I don't think that they are. Uh, in uh, one of the recommendations about reducing criminal prosecutions that carry the possibility of incarceration, thus reducing constitutionally required indigent representation services, it ends with short of advocating that the legislature reclassify appropriate petty and and or regulatory offenses to non jailable violations, local decisions of the district attorney could decrease the number of cases in which the Sixth Amendment requires a appointed counsel. Um, but I didn't see the district attorney as part of this report. And I'm wondering if we had conversations with the district attorney about these issues. I David could speak to that more fully, but they did interview and sit down with members of the district attorney's staff. Um, I don't think, you know, based on their conversations, anything they discussed rose to the level of a finding or was explored in depth, you know, to result in a finding. Um, but there were conversations with the DA's office as part of this assessment. It's a, it's a, to put it in there as, the, you know, that, that we need the, the DA to act differently in terms of scaling up the, the size of our public defense seems to be a critical part, right? It's something that I would support that a conversation and I would be glad if that, if that conversation took place. But I really think that we should get a little bit more information from the district attorney about his willingness or desire to, to do something like this. Um, I guess there's one last area to, um, uh, to talk about and that's the overall question of funding. Um, to me, when we started this process, um, I understood uh, broadly about the value of going for a different model. And one of the things that I felt was important was that I saw this as an opportunity to invest in our public defense system. In the 12 years that I've been on the board, I cannot think of any time in which we've made a particular investment in in uh, the, uh, our public defense system. Uh, we have made uh, investments in our uh, district attorney, uh, but, uh, but I can't remember anything in particular. Um, so I'm, I was excited about us moving forward and maybe making an, an investment uh, to do that. But this seems in, in part just moving around the chairs, taking the same amount of money, hoping you'll get uh, more out of it, although we're not sure we'll get to the standard that's been identified in this report. And you talked about funding, the, the, the new funding possibilities were through grants. So that's how, so there is funding set aside in the state budget um, that the state was required to make available for indigent defense. Um, and so all of that funding is being administered by the BSCC, and I believe they're establishing it and will be um, authorizing it through grant programs. There's funding for training, and I believe there's funding for some technical assistance. Um, there's also funding, uh, I believe, available at a national level in, in respect to the technical assistance area, or at least some support that might be provided. 
Well, I think that's great. And I'm glad that they're putting the money into it. But I think we as a board have got to start asking ourselves what kind of investment we're willing to make uh, because uh, funding public defense through grant programs seems to be an inherently risky uh, feature of a new system, especially a system in which we are 100% responsible for. And so knowing how much, you know, what our aspirations are and how much it costs becomes super important. Um, I may have more questions. There, there is also some inconsistencies that, that I've identified in this report. At one point it says that even though the, 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 there is the possibility of uh, interference with systems, it doesn't, they, they weren't able to find evidence where the, the request for things like experts was denied or held back. Um, and then later on in, in justifying some other system, it said, well, but they could hold this, um, hold the, ex, the use of experts back. So it, 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 it didn't jive with what our experience had been. Um, and so there were just some of those inconsistencies uh, with this report. I was uh, deeply troubled by the letter we received from Judge Volkman. And, um, and I see that there's a member of the judiciary here. So I look forward to hearing that. And I may have other questions after that. So thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I want to thank you for your report. Um, you're not the enemy. Uh, when, uh, when I'm going to speak here, I understand that you're putting a project before us and a proposal, and I appreciate the work you've put in for it. Uh, but, you know, I couldn't help uh, when I was reading over this being a little upset, uh, more than a little, uh, like the opening lines of the tale of two cities, the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, you can't get much worse than the times we have right now in Santa Cruz County. And this is changing something that's been stable and has been in place for about 45 years. And uh, all of a sudden we're supposed to deal with this when we've got COVID-19, uh, we have fires raging everywhere. We're trying to uh, house homeless people all over the county and take care of them and save them. So basically, I think the timing is very poor on it which uh, it really doesn't reflect on you because everything uh, that has happened should have delayed all of this uh, looking into. Uh, I see the word transparency that comes up quite a bit. Uh, we can, uh, you, there's common stuff in here when you're, when you're talking about firing somebody, uh, you tell them, hey, Charlie, you've done a really good job but we have to let you go. You, you, well, there, what we're saying here is that they haven't been transparent. We're, we're, we're saying if, they're, if they are transparent and if they're doing a good job, uh, we should keep them. So uh, I guess this kind of polite uh, wording for such a tremendous decision that we're making, it's like, hey, goodbye. Uh, we have to look at what's the reasons for anything. Uh, the cost, I looked into it, I saw 13 million there. It's actually about 12.5 million. I think I'm correct on that. Uh, when I looked up how much the cost was per year. And then uh, the other comes down to quality versus uh, cost. I haven't heard one complaint from uh, judges or anybody about the, the current way we're doing things with the uh, uh, public defender's office. And all of a sudden I'm reading stuff that makes it sound like it's a crisis. Well, a crisis doesn't happen overnight. It would have happened over the last 45 years. And so we have, uh, we have a track record of 45 years. Uh, I haven't read anything in the paper where uh, you know, a lawyer uh, reversal for being inept. I haven't read anything or heard anything from judges telling me uh, that, uh, that uh, poor people are not getting represented. So 
the other part is independent. Independence, uh, um, for example, if uh, if I got if I got picked up and arrested, I'm going to get arrested by a public uh, employee. That would be a deputy sheriff. I'd be taken to a jail that is uh, run by the county. It's a county jail. Uh, I would have a district attorney and his staff uh, going after me, and those are all public in, uh, employees of the county. Uh, the last thing I want to be told is, hey, we got a lawyer for you, but he works for the county also. So what I'm getting at is independence. Uh, I want a lawyer that's going to be independent. If I if I had the money, I wouldn't need to get a, a public defender. I'd go out and uh, hire Clarence Darrell, right? Or uh, F. Lee Bailey or something like that. But they don't work for the county. So the point is, I want, I want my lawyer to stick up for me and not look over his back at whether or not the county is going to keep him or let him go, or, or she, or uh, let uh, her let her go. And then uh, the fear of losing a contract. Um, I don't know what that is. Uh, uh, it's, it's the word chilling. Uh, it has an effect on the way uh, employees interact and how they, uh, you know, perform. So independence and uh, chilling factory factor. Uh, and then South County, uh, I saw that in the representation. Uh, there is a public defender's office right there in Watsonville, uh, one block away from the county uh, and city court, uh, courthouse. Uh, it seems a little big. I think it's about 3,000 square feet. It could probably be smaller. But the fact is we do have a public defender's office in Santa Cruz and in Watsonville. And so we're not adding or making things better. We're, we're duplicating what's being done already. So South County is being represented. I, I haven't heard one complaint in uh, what, nine years uh, from people saying, oh, I can't get a hold of an attorney. Uh, I, I'm not being uh, represented by a quality attorney. I've never heard that, I, and I haven't heard of that from any judges, uh, you know, in conversation. Um, so, and, and plus, I don't see too many uh, uh, lawsuits uh, being filed uh, against the public defender's office. I mean, uh, we deal with all the, a lot of that stuff uh, in closed session. I haven't seen one in uh, in nine years. Uh, or uh, I don't know how many court cases have been reversed by the current uh, staff that we have. Have there been any? I don't know. So we should have answers for that. And uh, uh, let's see. Again, uh, if if I was in trouble right now with uh, the coronavirus and uh, and the fires, the last thing I would want to be told is. We are going to try your case in the middle of all these crises, but at the same time being told we're going to transition over to another law firm. And we hope you don't get lost in the shuffle. I mean, it's not going to be a perfect scene right there. We're not going to just go right in with somebody else. It's going to be a very difficult thing. And we're also talking about, are we going to get the quality that we know we have now? We have a proven group for 45 years. We know how good they are and how bad they are, although all I've heard is good. Uh, and then we're going to change over this whole thing in the middle of the worst of times and, uh, and hope we don't lose somebody in the transition. Um, Let's see, South County, I mentioned that. And access to an attorney, I've never, I've never heard of anybody that didn't have money that couldn't get access to a public defender. And that's really important for South County. So I, I'm just trying to find out where this came from, where all these complaints came from that I haven't heard about. Can anybody so, tell me where Chair all Caput. of a sudden 
I can address some of your, your questions. Um, so this has been going on, you know, we started this, talking about this back in 2016 and memorialized, you know, a potential transition in the contract renewals in 2018. So this uh, preceded all of the current emergencies we're in. This has been, looking at this has been part of succession planning is because the contracts have, are coming to an end. And so we've been looking to figure out, you know, should we move to a new model or should we, you know, go to out for an RFP to continue to contract. So those are the, were some of the options before us. So, and looking at this, you know, we, we determined that switching to a, a public department is something that we're interested in trying to do and to put those investments into our indigent defense system. Um, and so that is our recommendation to the board and the, the framework we're proposing. There are, are alternatives, but this is what we're, we're recommending to the board. Okay, but you, you're talking about 2015 or 16? 2016 is when we started talking yeah, and about what, this. What brought about the, the, the whole thing back in 2015? Was it a public outcry? Was it a, uh, a string of lost cases? What is it? A no, there was no um, outcry or controversy. It was that our contracts were coming to an end. So it was a time to think about how we wanted to proceed into the future. And so we decided that we would examine this and figure out what options we had. And so in the course of that, we decided that this would be switching to a public model would be something that would be desirable and beneficial to the county. And that is why we're recommending this right. to the board. To, to be clear, yeah, we, we, as a, to be clear we voted to investigate what this model might look like. Right. And that's why they hired the Sixth Amendment Center to do this report. Correct. And it's ultimately our decisions about what we want to do that's with right. our public that's defense right. system. That's correct. But, uh, you're, you're recommending that we accept the, uh, the option of changing and that is our that's, that's where the argument comes in. We're gonna decide whether or not continue as is with a known quantity, quality and uh, a known you know, entity before us uh, compared to something we're not really quite sure of during the, probably one of the worst times in Santa Cruz County. Okay, um, we'll have uh, are they able to speak on their behalf? Or? Of course. They are. Of course. Yeah. Uh, how you don't, they, you, they you don't have, have to give limits? them a time limit, Chair. Well, you, could, you could have them make their case. Yeah. Are we on a three minute time limit? They can talk. You can make, let them talk as long as they want. All right. I'm, go, go ahead. See what you can do. And Maybe we have five, um, Mr. Chair. Take the, take the time. T take the time you need. Yeah. You can all, and uh, I'll let, uh, it'll be open mic. Thank you. Just so you don't go for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I totally promise. I will not do that. Uh, thank you for allowing us input in regard to this, uh, Mr. Chair. And thank you to the board for allowing us the opportunity here today to speak to you. Um, my name is Jerry Christensen, along with Eric Bigham, my partner, uh, and John Mintzloff. We have been your contract public defenders for 45 years. Uh, it's been a great and, uh, and, uh, and uh, wild ride, but a very successful one. And it's now a time period that we always, always imagined we would be here in front of you and we would be hand in hand with the CAO and with the judges would be very, very uh, uh, supportive. It would be a unified front, and we would figure out together and present to you how we move forward and give energy to this new entity. And that's what we had always imagined. That's what we had always hoped for. But we come to you with concern, uh, maybe even alarm, is a better word in regard to what the process has actually turned out to be. We would not have imagined that we would be here at this point in time where we essentially have the knowledgeable people 
that it's multiple judges who are down here and us as the public defenders for all these years who have essentially been sidelined in this process. We've not been kept in touch in any real significant fashion. And all of a sudden there's this report, uh, not a flattering report for us, a very unfair report that comes out. Now, we would assumed, but no, that someone would take uh, advantage of the 90 years with, in California law, criminal law, Santa Cruz County law, and in the vernacular of where we practice, in the trenches, in the courtrooms. We thought that would be something that would be really, really valuable to this process. Also, every time we've been reviewed for the entire time we've been in the business, including by some grand juries that uh, can be critical, we've always found that we do a very good job. Very good, not just good. So we're in a situation now where instead of bringing us into this process, the idea comes, let's spend a bunch of money, let's bring in some people from 3,000 miles away who know no California law at all, certainly no law in regard to trial work, what it really means to be in those trenches I'm talking about, no knowledge. What's the result? The result is relatively predictable. And you read it in Judge Volkman's letter that this report was so bad, so full of inaccuracies, so full of opinions, that in Judge Volkman's words, the assistant presiding judge who's sitting here today, the people who wrote this report should be ashamed of themselves, ashamed of themselves. So here's where we are now. We haven't, might, made sure we haven't had input in regard to this process. And we have a tremendous lack of trust and we really just have a, a, a somewhat of a big mess here that was highly, highly unnecessary. It would be best at this point in time if this board, which is a fine board with a lot of knowledge, is to basically press the reset button and bring back in those people who are knowledgeable of the process that's actually happening not some ivory tower type of group who don't have this kind of really down and dirty experience. That would be the best thing to do at this point in time. And bring in us, bring in the judges, bring in the sheriff. The sheriff doesn't want their jail to be completely overcrowded and, and uh, go the numbers to go crazy. Bring in the DA, they don't want additional cases. We all should be involved in regard to how we do this and how we do this in the best way without a harm to the system and to the clients. Now, in regard to your actions here today, ultimately we all agree that we're going to go into a public office. That's, that's something that we're all in agreement and it's okay, we'll get there, as long as it's done in the right fashion. But the last thing, the last thing in the world that you should do is to hire a public defender at this point in time. That would be disastrous. And why? Well, essentially just the hiring alone. What's it going to do to the staff in our office? Well, wait a minute. I thought Larry was the public defender. Who's this other public defender? And we all haven't, which they haven't, been offered jobs in the new department. And so the people there are really, really concerned. You add the additional thing of a public defender currently hired, who may be hiring staff, and everybody's gonna wonder, is that gonna be us? Is that not gonna be us? 
really disastrous. And if we lose people without the guarantee of jobs with the county, we can't hire anybody. Who's gonna come with us with a year or less than a year left? So again, the suggestion strongly from us, and we've been involved and we know the system, is that essentially today we do somewhat of a, a timeout and we bump this case over into the first part of next year, allow the knowledgeable people to get involved and get involved in guiding this process because that's something that has not been done up to this point in time. I do want to say one, one thing that we feel the public, the, uh, the Boston group. Um, Sixth Amendment. Yeah. Yes, Sixth Amendment. Uh, got right. They got one thing right, and it was the point that you were making earlier. And what they say is the new public defender must be independent, independent, which means they get a four-year contract and they can only be terminated for good cause. That is really, really important. Public defenders speak truth to power. It's not a popular position. It's a position can, that can be subject to political influence. And so at the very least, you still get your transparency. It doesn't matter whether they're at will or for good cause. You have that no matter what. But don't have someone up there who is looking over their shoulder all the time in regard to, wow, did I say something? Or did I step on the wrong toes? Oh, uh, uh, I'm gonna lose my job. I better draw back, forget the client for a moment, and preserve myself. So if you chop off the head, and if this process you're, you're allowed to chop off the head, the body ultimately is gonna go. And this is a really, really an idea that must be rejected. The idea that the CAO, the CAO who seems to like the Sixth Amendment report when it rips on Larry and Jerry, but when the Sixth Amendment says, they should have a good cause termination. Oh, no, no, no. We're suggesting that it be at will. It should not do that. Should not hire the current public defender now. Take a time out, put your thing over. But Larry and I would like to suggest something additionally that we think it would be really a great idea if we're looking for an independent public defender, as the Sixth Amendment project has suggested, that Santa Cruz County, with its progressive valued board and its overall progressive values, should have its public defender be elected. San Francisco does it. And San Francisco, interestingly, got really, really positive remarks in the Sixth Amendment report, okay? The DA here is publicly elected. Why not the public defender? And especially at this point in time in our lives, when we have this strong social justice movement and Black Lives Matter, well, a wonderful way of supporting Black Lives Matter would be to have a truly independent elected public defender who could stand tall and maybe, maybe, maybe help black and other lives matter even more. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. afternoon. Um, I'm Larry Bigham, the contract chief public defender. I think uh, preparing a succession plan for the next generation of indigent defense services is responsible public policy, and you should all be commended for that effort. But right now, the transition needs, as my partner said, a timeout and a reset so that myself and all of us who are affected by these decisions can have a voice at the table. I like and respect staff from the CIO's office but they know far less about the business of public defending than we do. 
The devil is in the detail in these matters. And rather than pick our brains about what are the pitfalls going forward in a transition or bridge to the new office, and what ideas do you have for improving our services in that public new office, they didn't walk the three blocks to my office to ask me that. They went 3,000 miles to Boston, who came in, and the Boston people never asked me those questions either about how do we get from BCM to a public office? Or if we had a public office, Larry, how could we improve services? No, the Boston group focused on the History Channel. They focused on and critiqued our current operation and didn't get into the Discovery Channel, if you will. And th then they write a report which is predictably biased and misleading. And I use the word predictably because if you read their earlier reports, wherever they go, the sky is always falling wherever they go. Now, in fairness to the Boston people, many parts of our country, the sky is falling when it comes to indigent defense services. The promise of Gideon has been underfunded and unfulfilled in many parts of this country and including parts of the California where there are public public defender offices. The delivery system is not the answer, it's who's in the system, what are the resources and political support. But I do agree that we should go to a public model eventually. Um, and I can discuss that at some greater length. But and I do agree we can improve our services and I do agree we can use more staff if that's what you wanna give me. Um, and, and we're always responding to new laws um, and, and, the, and the growth of collaborative courts with a public health paradigm, which is good. And we're responding to new technology that cops have. So no, our routine burglary has a, has a lot more discovery in terms of audio and video and gigabytes of evidence. And yes, we do need social workers and para paralegals. And I have other ideas, but I was never asked. Look, going forward, the system needs stability. The system needs continuity. People's lives are at risk here. We need to mitigate the disruption to the system in that bridge period from BCM to a public office. We got to make sure that our clients don't unnecessarily lose their relationship with their personal lawyer. And as you said, get lost in the shuffle, which is difficult enough under COVID because they're already getting lost in the shuffle. And to put a transition into this period would be chaotic. We need to keep current staff down on the farm for the length of this contract so that I can service the contract we need to delay the recruitment of a new public defender. Number one, that'll trigger unnecessary anxiety and confusion and uncertainty. But more than that, that new public defender will then staff up and poach my players. So then I lose lawyers. Now let's game this out. So then I gotta go hire. But how do I hire when I can only offer someone a six month job? What quality will you get? And then that lawyer comes in and has to ask for continuances in the court because they don't know anything about the new files. And then the jail gets backed up if those clients are in custody and the shelf life of that case gets doubled and tripled. There are consequences in an ecosystem justice system. You push a waterbed, you push it here, it has ripples over there. And the cases get delayed, the client doesn't get reasonably due process. The DA's victims don't get access to the courthouse or justice, as they would argue, and the sheriff is betting more people than necessary in the jail if we don't all do this together. What we need to do before we hire and rush to hire a public defender, and believe me, anyone you hire would have no more management, could have no more local management experience than he and I, and you know that. So you might as well leverage our, our guidance and wisdom here. Um, as they say, we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two over 45 years. So these, you should leverage the wisdom in the room and in the courthouse going forward. 
So we should develop an outline of a new public office. And I support the public model when it's right, ripe. I do that. We should, we should have input into the building of that model and uh, the blueprint of that model. We should build that cart before we go hire the horse. You just don't go hire the horse and build the model because no horse is gonna have more experience and wisdom locally at least than we do. You've got to guarantee all staff members jobs. Guarantee, not hope for, wish for, weasel words, guarantee. You've got to make it so that I can backfill positions. If there is an, if there's a, a, a position, a vacancy, I've got to promise that new recruit who may want to relocate his family to Santa Cruz, I've got to promise him a new job in the new office. I've got to have that ability or I can't recruit. And finally, we need to discuss our current caseload. I've got a list here right now of 15 homicides right now in my office. Some of them very serious, including the new capital case we just got. And we can't get jury trials out because of COVID. So most of these cases are gonna be alive and well in June of 2022 at the termination of my contract. On top of this, I've got about 3000 live cases right now in the office and we can't get resolution because of COVID. So that, that, that number is gonna go up because we don't have exit ramps now. We don't have jury trials now. Those cases are, are our cases. And without communication and cooperation, the county will end up paying for two public defender offices well beyond July 1st, 2022. We've got to work out these details together. All of this needs to be discussed before we go too far down the road, before we get too far ahead of ourselves. These decisions affect people's lives. They should not be made in a silo. They require time and input and collaboration and trust. Thank you. Chair Caput, members of the board, I'm Paul Verdick. I'm the presiding judge of the Superior Court. I'm here to echo the concerns you've just heard from Mr. Bingham and Mr. Christensen. I'm here with my assistant presiding judge, Tim Volkman. And I think from the comments that you folks have made this afternoon, you recognize the concerns that we have. Um, Supervisor Friend observed that we'll have a crisis on our hand if we don't have folks guaranteed with jobs. Supervisor Leopold observed that there seems to be a significant disparity between what's contained in the Sixth Amendment report and what our actual experience is in the courtroom. And Chair Caput has recognized that um, if there is no crisis, what is the purpose of this plan? We're not here to take a position on the wisdom of whether it's appropriate to move from contract provided defense services to an in-house public defender. That's a decision for you folks to make and whether you're willing to spend the significant amount of money that it's gonna take you to do that, I guarantee you it will cost you substantially more. We are here to share our concerns with you about how we get from here to there. And Mr. Bingham has presented to you what he has shared with me, that there's substantial risk he will lose his employees. If there's one thing the Sixth Amendment report got right, what happens in the courtroom and what happens in our justice system is akin to a three-legged stool. The court, the district attorney, and the public defender have to work together to ensure that this justice system works. And I have to say, I felt tremendously disrespected by the county administrative office when they did not consult with the court at all about the transition plan they proposed to you today. 
We were informed on Monday, September 21st, that a county administrative office intended to release the Sixth Amendment report the following Thursday, that Thursday, the 24th. When we heard that, we requested a meeting and it was for the first time, Thursday, September 24th, that we learned of this transition plan. We were never consulted about the notion that they now propose to have you follow through with as to how we get from here to there over the course of the next 18 months or so. I will tell you, based upon your observations, Chair Caput, that I've been the presiding judge for close to 15 years. I'm sorry, I've been a, a judge for close to 15 years. I've been the presiding judge for three years now, two years as assistant presiding judge. I was a practicing attorney for 25 years in Santa Cruz County before I became a judge. And I think you will have to search your institutional memory as it relates to all county departments throughout this county, whether you can find one other department over a 45 year period that has not had a single lawsuit filed against them that the county has had to respond to. I'm not aware on my 15 years on the bench that there has been a single case handled by the public defender's office or any of the conflict firms that have been reversed on appeal due to ineffective assistance of counsel. So in answer to your question, Chair Caput, as to whether there has been a crisis that results in the proposal, in my view, there is not. What we're, you're in risk of doing if you adopt this proposal and immediately open this position up for recruitment is you will create crisis. Uncertainty uh, will undoubtedly follow. I think it's starting to creep in now just by the idea that this is going to occur. If they lose employees, they will not be able to fill those positions in. If they get understaffed, our court system gets adversely affected. The community gets adversely affected. The jail begins to overcrowd. There is a better way to do this. And I think you can find a way to do this, respectfully, Ms. Colburn, if you involve the court in the discussion, if you involve the court in the planning process, if you involve Mr. Bigham in the discussion, if you involve him in the planning process, we have three things, the court has three things we ask of you. Defer this proposal and direct your county administrative officer to meet with the court together with Mr. Bingham, possibly the district attorney, to explore whether there may be an alternative transition plan. We ask that you direct the county administrative office to include either the presiding judge or the court administrative officer on its technical transition team. And finally, that uh, an alternative transition plan be attempted before you adopt this proposed plan. Mm -hmm. uh, judge Volkman's come with me today so that we could convey to you how seriously concerned we are about the current proposal. Judge Volkman is more familiar with the intricacies of the Sixth Amendment report. So if any of you had any questions about that report, he's prepared to answer them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name's Tim Volkman. I'm a Superior Court judge. I've been a Superior Court judge for 12 years. I was in private practice in San Cruz County for 28 years before that. So I've been involved in the legal system for 40 years, all in Santa Cruz County. I appreciate you folks giving me and the rest of these gentlemen the time this afternoon. I'm not certain that I wanna jump into Judge Burdick's offer that I go through the intricacies of 170 page report necessarily, but you folks have my five page letter. I thank you very much for reading that. I stand on every single sentence I put within that letter. Separate and distinct from that letter. I'm trying to move forward on this thing, not move backward. Whatever you folks decide regarding the issue of the public defender's office, that's your decision. Whatever you folks decide in terms of hiring, of a different public defender, who you hire in terms of uh, folks to fill in for attorneys and staff, that's your decision. 
But this document that was presented by Ms. Colburn this afternoon is a glaring example of the concern that we have from the court's perspective. She describes the creating of a foundation and we want county collaboration and partnerships. And then she has the document, collaboration and partnerships. The court is nowhere in that document, nowhere. She has a lot of other entities listed, not the court. I don't know how you can proceed with this type of process without involving the entity that's going to be involved in implementing this process. I'm gonna take, I think it was her second to last sentence as accurate. I'm trying to move forward with this. We're gonna try to be positive from this point forward. I think her second to last sentence was, we look forward to receiving the input and the guidance from the court regarding this issue. I'm gonna take Ms. Coburn at her word in that regard. I'm gonna be the presiding judge next year and for the next three years after that. I'll be looking forward to working with Ms. Coburn and the CAO regarding this process, but we need to be in the room. We need to be contacted for our input, our guidance. And that's what we're asking for today. And I appreciate your time. All these other gentlemen handled everything I was going to say up to this point. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Chair, Chair I'm, I'm, if you mind. I appreciate the testimony we received here today, and and it goes without saying. I think uh, the the board is is uh, united uh, in agreement uh, that we value the services that we have received in, in public defense. And as was pointed out uh, by uh, I think uh, Judge Burdick, that there's never been um, an instance where uh, the 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 quality of the representation was challenged in court. Uh, that 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 uh, someone in Santa Cruz had received ineffective representation uh, from our public defense firm. So anything that we're doing here is not coming out of a sense of crisis. It, there isn't there there isn't we haven't had a series of bad cases or ineffective representation. But I think our board has been interested in trying to think about the day past w when uh, a BCM is is going to be. The, the public defense system. And that's why we started this process. And, and I think we're united in that because that's, that's good uh, management, good, good uh, uh, thoughtfulness of trying to figure out how you change after something you've had for 45 years. But it's a big change. It's a huge change. And um, there's been a number of questions that are raised. Uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't read this report till this weekend. I probably should have, uh, uh, Mr. Bingham had sent me a draft copy uh, that I hadn't seen, but I, I didn't have a chance to read it because of everything going on in my life until this weekend. And so there were a lot of questions I had about that. And I brought that up earlier. And so I don't think, I, I'm not ready to move forward uh, with this today. Uh, I think that this is a huge change and we should, we should work to get it right then rather than just getting it done quickly. And so um, I think that I'd like the, to direct our county administrative office uh, to sit down with the courts and, uh, uh, and BCM um, and potentially the district attorney or the sheriff, uh, as was uh, alluded to in the comments, to talk about this plan. Um, I would like either the CAO's office or, or the Sixth Amendment Center to tell me who's actually meeting the standards that were set out in this report um, and to give us some idea of what the additional cost would be to do that. There are good standards in here, right? I mean, the, about making sure that, the, that you don't have lawyers who are overwhelmed or uh, social workers I, that, and technology, those are all good. So I think, so that my, to uh, help the county clerk here to make a clear motion is that uh, we direct the CAO uh, to sit down with the judiciary and uh, and the public defense firm and potentially the DA and the sheriff's office to talk about this transition and to come back to us with, with uh, some recommendations to answer the questions about who is meeting the standards, what would be the cost of meeting those standards. Um, and then I think we also need to have a policy 
of, for the hiring of at least first right of refusal or something better. When we did the garbage contract, we had provisions in that contract that people in the existing firm would be hired by the new firm. We should have that at least as good in, in our language here. Um, and the, the issue of, of uh, the attorneys that are at the firm now uh, to know what their future is gonna be like is important. The ability to be able to, uh, to recruit, retain and promote become important. So meeting standards, costs, and a policy on uh, hiring that at least has first right of refusal. I would make that as a motion. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, or uh, do we have any other uh, public comments? We have one comment that came through the web portal from Ken Davenport. The assessment of indigent defense services in Santa Cruz County is well done. I support the findings and recommendations. Thank you. And that is the last one. Supervisor Coonerty, you wanted uh, anybody? Uh, you wanted to uh, speak after public comment? <laughs> Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. We've been having trouble with that. Uh, yeah, he's, he's had trouble uh, staying on there. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll go with uh, Supervisor McPherson. We'll come back to Ryan. Yeah, I, I have a question uh, that um, Maybe uh, the, the CAO himself would be best to answer, but um, I, I'm just trying to, in this process, you know, I don't, I don't see, I think everybody seems to be agreed this is where we're going to be going to have a public, public defender, but I, I don't know, I'm just trying to get an idea of uh, why the judges in particular weren't consulted in the process, and I don't know if you're, it's fair to ask, uh, Ms. Coburn, because uh, this process has been going on for a long time before she became the uh, acting CAO. But can you give me any kind of an answer to that, or us any, any kind of an answer? Why weren't I think they should be somewhere before we make a decision. They should have some uh, definitive input on this more than they were provided in the, up to now. But uh, can you give me an answer to that? So Supervisor McPherson, so the, the, there always has been a plan at, to include the judges and the firms on the substantive you know, elements of transitioning to a public model. To date, we've been focused on you know, completing the assessment and moving forward, figuring out some of the administrative components of that. There's still a huge body of work, as I think I mentioned and was acknowledged by the court and the firms to complete. So it's through all of that work that we still need to collaborate with the court. And we acknowledge that and have every intention of sitting down with them. Well, I, um, I, I think under the situation we have now with, um, it might, this might not be the time to make a decision today, as Mr. Leopold, Supervisor Leopold said. Um, uh, I'm just concerned that um, going going at it forward from here, I think we're uh, we're going to be better served if we have some uh, additional input. And I know you've had a lot of uh, a lot of input from one one source or another up to now, but I think. Um, it would do us well in the transition uh, that is to come. I feel convinced of that myself in the in the future. Um, but I don't. Uh, I think we ne need to get a timeline because I think this contract is going to be up in July of uh, I, I, or June June thirtieth, I guess, of two thousand twenty-two. But um, I think everybody would feel uh, more comfortable in general, uh, and particularly the judiciary, if we. Um, if we gave it some more time, and I hate to continue things on because I think we're headed in the right direction of what we're going to do ultimately, but um, I just think that uh, 
we're going to have a better plan in the end if we get more input. And I, I wouldn't like to see this drag on for more than, oh, four or five months or something, but we could get something to report back with the input that we seek um, by, say, March of uh, 2021. That's my, if we do that, if we're going to continue this, I think we have to have some input and let's keep moving because I think once the decision's made that uh, finally that we're going to do this, it is going to take a year to implement or to get in the process uh, of, of establishing a public public defender office. So I, I would I would be open to adding uh, more input, but I would like to get a timeline on it so we can uh, move forward with it so we can put this office in place if indeed we decide to do that in 2022. Um, and that would be my suggestion. So um, I, I, I think, uh, I don't know how uh, Supervisor Leopold figures that. I just don't want to have this go on for another year. So we're waiting until 2023 when the contract with the current public defender has already been uh, reached uh, the deadline. So um, Person, if I, I may. just want to try to get the timeliness of it done. I think we would, um, we would be uh, able to meet with the court and BCM and the other partners um, soon and work towards, you know, responding to these requests. And I would like to return to the board as soon as capable, you know, as soon as possible with some more information. Like I mentioned, there are only 21 months. If we do want to transition by July 1st of 2022, we have to get moving. There's a lot to work out both administratively, logistically, policy-wise, um, there's a huge body of work. So we really have to get moving if we wanted, if the board is interested in making this transition. If there was an interest in doing something else, we would have to pivot in, you know, in an, another direction. How, what, what would be um, a reasonable timeline for, for us to do that? I mean, it sounds like the, the judiciary, the judges are willing to get together to have their input and so forth. Uh, I mean, would you like it earlier than March? And, and I'm speaking uh, without even consulting Mr. Leopold if he agrees with this, uh, this directive to get together with these parties uh, as soon as possible so we can meet that timeline by June of uh, 20 or July 1st, 2022. What, what kind of a timeline would you like? I mean, we've got a lot of things on our plate now, as we know, but what would be a reasonable time? Uh, uh, Supervisor McPherson, uh, thank you uh, for your comments. I think what I hear today from uh, the current presiding judge and the incoming presiding judge and uh, from the, the public defense firm is that they would see this as a priority, that they would make time to, to sit down and that we can move deliberatively to, to, uh, to address these issues that have been identified here today. So um, we should be able to make great progress uh, relatively quickly. They could come back in November um, and, uh, and at least give us a status update. And then we, we could find out if we're, uh, if we're uh, a yard, feet or inches apart. <laughs> Um, and figure out what we can get done uh, as quickly as possible to get this. But the important thing is to get it done right. We cannot have the defense of, of, mm -hmm. of people in this county compromised by not thinking through this as well as possible. That, is, that has got to be key to everything we do. Okay. Um. Ooh, move I skip. Supervisor. I think Supervisor. Supervisor. Back, back to Coonerty. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I think my political opponents are messing with my uh, broadband today. Um, so uh, I just want to say I, I attempted to second Supervisor Leopold's motion. I agree with Supervisor McPherson's concerns about not having this delay too long. Um, and the brief comments I wanted to make are, you know, I have uh, Larry Bigham come to my classes uh, and speak to my prospective law students every year. And I send my students to work at their law firm um, because I believe that they're the best lawyers 
uh, around and the kind of uh, lawyers I hope my students grow up to be. And so I want to appreciate their 45 years of service and commitment and really amazing advocacy for their clients uh, over this time. Uh, as, as we make this transition, it's important that we do it right. It's important that we have partnerships uh, and a sense of collaboration um, uh, with all the different stakeholders uh, in this. And so that's why I support Supervisor Leopold's uh, motion to, to, to have those conversations. Um, I do think the Sixth Amendment report does bring up um, a, a challenge for our system, which is a real lack of data about sort of the number of cases, how long they're taking, uh, the caseloads per attorney, um, what that's what what a what a what a, an improved or a, uh, um, a staffing that that meets these requirements look like, how likely it is, what the budget looks like, um, and we need the data going forward. I do think that the board. Uh, both directly and through the CAO plays an important role here because um, in my experience, we have each one of our partners in the criminal justice system does an outstanding job, but um, in, in each of their silos, and some of those silos are inevitable, but some uh, don't have to be, uh, we get some inefficiencies and we get uh, you know, sort of everyone doing their job really well, but the outcome for the individual and for the community isn't as good as it should be. And I think when we look at this system, it's important that we aren't just replicating one piece of it uh, or looking at a new element for one piece of it, but thinking about how we can figure out a better system going forward that serves both those accused and the community and the victims. Um, well into the future so so that's the i think i think when we have these conversations it shouldn't just be about it's it's important that we understand the staffing models and making sure we don't lose people along the way but it's also a little it's also about how we build a better system uh going forward so um thank you i want to thank everybody for their work and for the comments today which i think will move us towards a better process Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, th this is a very serious decision with uh, very serious uh, consequences. So, I mean, we, we do have another option. Uh, uh, wh when does the current contract uh, run out? It expires June 30th of 2022. So we have 21 months until okay, they expire. 2022. I mean, we could uh, put this to rest real quick by offering a new contract to the current uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, stakeholders here. Uh, we could uh, we could offer a th what three four year contract or whatever, and then we can go on to other business that's uh, pressing with the county. Anyway, well, I'll, uh, well, I'll make uh, that motion that well, I'll make well, that motion that we offer uh, we offer a new contract that it'll extend it to 2020, 2025, 26, whatever. Chair, well, well, I appreciate your sentiments. Uh, as chair, you're not allowed to make motions. You can only second motions. Okay. So I'm going to try again now that we have uh, now that we have everybody. I think still on the line. Um, is that we direct the, the CAO to meet with the, the justice partners um, of the, the judiciary, the public defense, the DA, and potentially the sheriff um, to uh, come back with information and recommendations from that group um, that we have a policy about the, uh, about the hiring, a clear policy about the hiring. Um, that uh, we get information from the Sixth Amendment Center about who is meeting these standards and some idea of what the cost would be uh, uh, to to uh, move this forward. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, we got we got that. Uh, I did make a motion though. Uh, I, I, okay. Maybe it'll fail for lack of a second. Well, chair, uh, or we chair could ask Cappet, the parliamentarian. I, yeah, but... you're the chair, so the motion would have to be from oh, one of the right. other members of the board. <laughs> You could have stepped down as a chair and then you can make your motion. <laughs> that, 
That's Don't correct. Do that. That's correct. May that's I sorry. ask? I guess because we have the judges here, that's why we had to have a parliamentary procedure. So I, I, I appreciate that. Okay. But there is a motion and there is a second. Mr. Uh, Chair, okay. can I, so, Mr. Know. Chair, could I ask for a clarification on the motion? Did it include to return in November? Uh, yes. Okay. Could I could I ask that you bump it at least a month or two, John? I mean, I have a day job. Does so do the judges, and we have a lot to work out. I'm not yeah, trying I, to delay I, things. And frankly, uh, Mr. Cabot, at the end of the contract, if you need a few more months, I, come on, I'm going to work with the county. Yeah. Um, uh, whatever the county needs. But my point is, we've got a lot to work out, and and I have a lot on my plate besides this issue. So I would ask that you give me another <laughs> month anyway. And yeah. I, I think we all have a lot of stuff we're working on. So. I can guarantee you I have a lot of stuff I'm working on for the next <laughs> 27 days. So uh, um, what I would like is, is some kind of report back to see how this is going uh, in November. Uh, we may not resolve this in November. Um, but but I'm hoping that by November there's been a meeting, that there's some agreement about where we're going. You know, that, that we, as I say, we may not have it all resolved, but we got to, I would like everybody to be working deliberatively uh, uh, towards this. Uh, I, I would go if we're, if we're not going to make a decision in November. Uh, if, if we're going to make a decision in November, I'm not comfortable. Uh, I, I'm not committing to a decision. I'm committing to, to getting a report back. That's what I, that's a what I'm that's Just what I'm a report back. Yes. Without a motion to. Uh, uh, we're, we aren't committing to anything other than these people meeting <laughs> and getting some additional information and getting a report back in November. Okay, but we're not gonna have a, a staff recommendation for changing. We ultimately make the decisions. But not in November. Well, um, yeah, okay. uh, and any, on any day, three votes do anything on this board, right. but, uh, but uh, ultimately these, these are our decisions to make. I, I agree, I agree. Yeah. And um, uh, certainly not going to do it in December either, because right before Christmas, we're going to say yes or no or something like that. Yeah. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, so read the, read the motion uh, as clearly as you understand it. <laughs> there is a motion and by Supervisor Leopold to direct the county administrative officer to one, meet with the justice partners, and he named all three. Two, with a policy about the hiring. Three, get information from the Sixth Amendment Center and an idea of the costs. And return in November with a report on the status. Yeah, and the, the, the information is on who's meeting these standards that they've identified. So Mr. Chair, this is uh, Supervisor Friend. I just want to speak uh, both in favor of the motion, but also provide a little bit of additional information. I mean, one to your question about whether something would come back in November. Well, if they have substantive discussions and reach some sort of greater understanding then it is possible in November that we could take uh, greater action too. I think it's important for all the parties to recognize um, that are present today that the board is moving forward with the transition to a public model. So the operating of this discussion should be under that understanding and framework, this is a discussion about how that transition should occur, which are issues that uh, have been rightfully brought up today on staffing, as well as how it, it would impact current and future cases that occur between now and when that final transition occurs. But also additionally, we should also recognize that, that we may not be able to resolve every difference between uh, or every desire between the current contract public defender, uh, the Sixth Amendment Center, uh, other members of the judiciary and, and public safety partners. Realistically, as Supervisor Leopold uh, mentioned, and I know was mentioned by Judge Burdick, this is a decision that is made by the board. The goal here though, is to have as seamless and uh, positive as a transition as possible because there is unique knowledge uh, within the current public defender's office that, that doesn't exist within any other structure within the county. There's unique knowledge within the DA's office. There's unique knowledge within those that sit in the judiciary that none of us have. And we need that advice in order to successfully transition this because we're taking the cases that we're talking about couldn't have greater magnitude or seriousness. And the people that rely on these services absolutely rely on us to make the right decisions. So what should be that should be the guiding principle 
But additionally, again, we are moving toward that model. So it, hopefully everybody comes to the table with that understanding and that settled and with an open mind on how to get there in a seamless way as possible. And I think that uh, I recognize and totally understand, uh, Mr. Bigham, that you've got a lot of other stuff going on. Uh, but we are trying to uh, move this forward in a way toward that understanding and to the degree that we can move a lot of this forward by mid-November would be uh, ideal for everybody. So I'm supportive of the motion. Uh, can I just ask one thing? Uh, you said no, November, and we're, we have meetings scheduled for the 10th and 17th. Did you want to specify which one? I, 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 the one week difference, uh, I, I don't know what the schedule is for the meeting, so November seems good to me, um, rather than saying which meeting in November, if that's okay. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to vote on it, but uh, what the only thing that I hear the language about transition, that almost sounds like uh, uh, that means so, somebody might have made up their mind already uh, that we're going to have a transition. We're, we're not talking about a transition, we're talking about looking at something and it's possible we're going to stay with what we currently have, the known entity we have. Is that correct? What, what I, what, uh, Chair Caput, uh, what I heard from Mr. Bingham is he and Mr. Christensen support the idea of a public model, and we what, and what we're and what we're trying to to get to is figure out how to how to make that work well. It uh, we decide on when that's going to happen. That could happen in June 2022, could happen later than June 2022. That's our, that's our choice. But, but uh, our, goal, our goal should be that we have great public defense in Santa Cruz County and that those who can't afford their own lawyers still get the best defense possible uh, in Santa Cruz County. Okay, so the transition could also mean we go with what we have right now. <laughs> Uh, I just uh, 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 we are not committing to uh, to to either something. Either way, we it, are it, not committing to something today. All right, that that's fine. But I I just don't like the word transition. It sounds like we we're we're going to change later than now. Well, we may not change at all. Uh, for the billing part, the invoicing, we already have the cover letter. You know. <laughs> and, you know, we have all the letters, and I don't know, Rainy, if we actually got those left, the letters have been out last year, but oh. I got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. And now for something completely different. Uh, so ultimately, it's our decision. Uh, we're not committing to what it's going to look like today. There's clearly interest on the board to move this, but we're not committing to something today. Not committed. Great. Okay. Good. I'm ready to go. All right. Unless we have other comments. Um, <laughs> we close public no. comment. <laughs> okay. I'll call the roll. Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Chairman Caput. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. And that'll take us to number. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, number 12, consider approval and concept of ordinance amending chapter 2.126, Santa Cruz County Code relating to the addition of new representatives to the Commission on Justice and Gender to include a representative of the black or African American community and a woman who has experienced incarceration and schedule the ordinance for final adoption on October 20, 2020, as outlined in the memorandum of Supervisor Leopold. So we'll open with uh, C Supervisor Leopold. Sure. Um, uh, Chair, you may remember that we spent two years in the Justice and Gender Task Force, and in January, this board voted to create the Justice and Gender Commission. Um, uh, obviously, COVID has, has, has uh, set a l many things back. Uh, during that, uh, uh, during this time, we've also uh, seen the real rise of the Black Lives Matter movement here in Santa Cruz. And as part of that, I've been meeting with the local NAACP who pointed out the, 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 the big question that we, that of the, the question of othering, that we are not, that we are lumping 
uh, the black community in with everyone else. And when you look at this, uh, the demographics of those who are in our jail, um, the, the black community is overrepresented as compared to their demographics in our community. So it seems important to have a representative from the black community on there. And I believe it was probably an oversight on our, on, um, on our part uh, to make sure that there was a woman who had experienced incarceration as part of this Justice and Gender Commission. So I hope the board will uh, support these two new additions to this commission. Uh, any other comments from board members? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll just say I'm all for it. Uh, I, the only uh, thing that's difficult sometimes is when you try to acknowledge one group, uh, maybe we're leaving out, uh, you know, someone of Asian uh, descent or someone Native American, Indian. Uh, so, but at this time uh, for this motion, this is uh, uh, a, a good step forward and I'm all for it. Thank you. I would move approval. I'll second. Do we want to check if there's any public comment on the web? Oh, I, I have, I'll open it up for public comment. None? We have no web comments. Okay. Bring it back to the board. We have the... Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. McPherson. Supervisor McPherson? Aye. Oh. Aye. And Chairman Caput? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. It takes us to item number 13. Consider approval in concept of ordinance amending chapter 8.48 of the Santa Cruz County Code to extend the prohibit <coughs> prohibitation of commercial, <laughs> I'm sorry, of commercial evictions arising from substantial income loss related to the COVID-19 pandemic through March 31, 2021, and schedule the ordinance for final adoption on October 20th, 2020, as outlined in the memorandum of supervisors Leopold and Coonerty. We'll open up with uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, thank you, I think the ordinance speaks for itself um, and it's an important effort to uh, help people respond to this pandemic and ensure our economic vitality. States, uh, the legislature took care of residential uh, eviction uh, with legislation, but did nothing about commercials uh, uh, properties, and this helps uh, protect our local businesses. Okay. Uh, any other comments from board members? <clears throat> I move approval of the recommended actions. Second. Okay, I'll open it pub up for pub public pub comment. Pub yeah. We have no web comments, thank you. Go ahead. All right, Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Chairman Caput. Aye, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, closed session, nothing to report out of closed session, right? Uh, no, nothing uh, reportable out of closed session from earlier this afternoon, and we're all set. Next regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors is uh, 9 a.m. Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. Thank you, everybody. I, 